Okay, I'm going to call this meeting to order of the Bellingham City Council for August 4th, 2014. A couple of announcements today. The next City Council meeting will be next Monday, August 11th. We usually have a two-week break, but this time we're meeting back-to-back, -back, two weeks in a row. Then the Council will be in recess until September 8th. Uh, tomorrow, August 5th, is the National Night Out Against Crime, and uh, I'm going to read this little announcement. Join your downtown neighbors and everyone in the city who would like for a fun picnic at Maritime Heritage Park for National Night Out. Bring a blanket and either enjoy your own dinner or food from a local food truck. There will be games, live music, yoga, a bouncy castle. <laughs> and fun activities for the whole family. This event is sponsored by Downtown Bellingham Partnership and the City of Bellingham in partnership with the Lettered Streets Neighborhood Association. I'd also like to take a moment um, <clears throat> and just have a moment of silence and recognize a longtime contributor to our meetings, a community member named Leonard Lindstrom who passed away over the weekend. Leonard, uh, I think, always shared from his own experience and his knowledge to better our community and so I'd like to take just a moment for us to recognize that. Thank you. Bellingham City Council meets all requirements of the State of Washington Open Meetings Act. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call. Terry Borneman. Here. Jean Knutson. Here. Kathy Lehman. Here. Michael Eliquist. Here. Roxanne Murphy. Here. Pinky Vargas. Here. Jack Weiss. Here. Thank you. Okay, next up is our 15 minute public comment period. We are going to do public comment for 15 minutes. Then I will close the public comment period. We'll conduct the business of the city council. Actually, we don't have any public hearings this evening. No, so we're gonna go through the entire uh, public comment period right now. That's good. Okay, so I'll read the first three names. If you could come up to a microphone and uh, introduce yourself and form a line at the door there, or there's also a second microphone up here. We've got quite a few names this evening, so uh, there is a three minute limit. And if you want to take less time than that, that's okay too. Uh, Kate Haskell, followed by Ken Choval and Simi Jane. Good evening, Council. Um, my name is Kate Haskell, and I live and work in the city of Bellingham, and this is the second time I'm addressing you about the property on 801 Samish. Um, I'm one of the nine psychotherapists in that group, and we made a request for a short timeline because we had only just come across the property in early July. It appeared that um, to be the only one within the city that met our requirements for transportation, dil disability, and budget. And budget is really the point I would like to have you listen to tonight. We also felt the need to respond to the neighbors and some of the public letters that were written. And we reached out to them. We held two informal public meetings. We have spoken on the phone with them. We've walked the neighborhood. We've spoken to all the neighbors that were home in the adjoining condominium complex. And so I'd like to pass to you all some exhibits that I would just like you to reference while I speak. You may have already seen them. There have been a number of people who have come forward <laughs> in that process and in those conversations that support both, everyone we've spoken to supports us doing our work there. There's a difference of opinion about the docketing and the concerns about rezoning. Specifically, all the neighbors who immediately border the property are in support of docketing 
tonight except the homeowner to the south. Those people are all highlighted in yellow on that first page. Their signatures are on a petition, and we've spoken to every one of them directly, in addition to the neighbors who border the property to the south. The neighbors, those neighbors were heartened by some of council's discussion with the planning department today about possible uh, flexibility and collaboration around the specifics around this rezone. So they were heartened by that part of the conversation. It appears that you are going to make a recommendation that we are allowed a very gracious ability to start docketing in the process method, which does meet some of the concerns that have been raised. However, for us, that is challenging because it will in, in cumber the property, and we will have to see if the seller and ourselves can hold on to that property for those 75 days, in addition to the other time that it would take for the full rezone process to go on. So the property is in agreement, but it is more challenging economically for us. We are small business owners. We are not developers. We are reaching to do this as, as it is. And um, we um, hope that you all understand that we do not have the resources of developers or investors. And further docketing delay may increase our financial burden. Thank you very much for hearing my comments. Thank you. Ken Chovil. Good evening, council members. My name is Ken Chovil. My wife, Lisa, and I live at 816 36th Street. I'd like to thank you tonight for the opportunity to speak in support of the request to rezone the Samish Way Church of Christ property on Samish Way, rather the docketing of uh, the proposal to rezone the property. We live directly behind the church property. The view from our home looks out directly over the green space, the parking lot, and over the roof of the church. Docketing needs to move forward very quickly. There's an urgency here, and I'm, I'm going to explain to you why. We enthusiastically support the sale of the church to Pacific Harbor, and so do all of the neighbors on 36th Street whose homes abut this property. I know you've heard uh, from some people in the Samish neighborhood um, who oppose docketing, but those people are really not our neighbors. They don't, as far as I know, they don't live within view of the church, and they certainly don't live in the Ridgemont neighborhood. Almost everyone I've spoken to, as I said, supports this project, and here are the reasons why. The church has been a wonderful neighbor to us uh, for longer than most of us have lived in the neighborhood. It's a serene park-like setting that blends in well with the neighborhood. We love this project because it promises to continue that tradition and, of course, we would support that. Further development of the property of any type will be out of character with the neighborhood as per the reason I just mentioned. The church property is an ideal location to allow access to badly needed mental health services, as we talked about on the 21st. Why is this happening so fast? And it does seem as though it's happening very fast. Many of us didn't even know the property was for sale. Personally, I didn't know until I looked it up on Zillow just happened to see it on Zillow a few weeks ago. But the church must sell the property. They need to move on. Pacific Harbor must have a new home. They need to move on. Nobody could have predicted the timing of this. But we have a good match here. Delaying the docketing could very likely kill this deal. And we want this to be able to move forward. City government <coughs> has to be mobile enough to respond quickly when it's needed. Pacific Harbor is a committed group of practitioners, small business owners trying to create an opportunity to sustain their business for years to come. Their business is in the service to people, not unlike a church ministry, and I see I'm running out of time. I urge you, please, to allow this docketing to move forward. We realize we're just beginning the public process, but unnecessarily unnecessary delay, such as the seven years taken to make a decision on Sunset, 
in that neighborhood in the sunny land just won't work here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. Simi Jane, followed by Ellen Murphy, Pat McKee, and Jean Marks. Good evening, Simi Jane, Zender Thurston, PS, 1700 D Street. I'm representing Pacific Harbor Holdings this evening, and um, we respectfully request that you affirm your initial intent to approve the proposal for docketing uh, 801 Samish Way for rezone um, to Area 9. I've outlined in a couple of letters how the application meets the requirements of the Bellingham Municipal Code. And the council collectively found by unanimous vote two weeks ago that the proposal met the docketing criteria. I attended the planning committee work session this morning and was disappointed to learn that the committee is going to recommend that the proposal not be docketed at this time, but instead ask that Pacific Harbor Holdings go back and apply for um, docketing and go through the planning commission process first and allow the council to reconsider the request at a, another time. I was disappointed to hear that one of the reasons for this recommendation was um, expression of guilt as to the decision um, of intent made at the last meeting by your unanimous vote. What I didn't hear is that the proposal does not meet the docketing criteria. And I didn't hear that planning staff has to go back and submit an application for docketing in order to add a sliver of property onto the Area 9 application that properly went through the um, docketing, the other docketing procedure. First, I don't think the, counts, the council should feel guilty about following its own code. You adopted that provision so that you could take advantage of opportunities as they arise. And this is one of those opportunities. It requires quick action. And the only thing you need to do is find that it meets the docketing criteria. I think the only thing the council should feel guilty about tonight is if you change your mind and potentially stop this opportunity. You've heard our client is under a strict budget, and you heard, some of you heard earlier today that staff believes they can complete the docketing process within 60 days. I am a practitioner here in the city of Bellingham and have been through rezone procedures before. I think that that is incredible. It takes 60 days just to comply with the notice requirements for the planning commission and the city council when you're going through the docketing process. That's 60 of the 75 days that they presented to you this morning. Um, I think it's gonna take longer than that. I think the rezone application process takes longer than that. And all of those um, delays will point in the direction of this opportunity being lost rather than gained. <coughs> and the gain to this community is not only to the mental health community, but to the city of Bellingham. And I impress again that the docketing um, procedure that you went through last week is provided for in the code, and I urge you to follow the code and your vote last week. Thank you. Thank you, Simi. Ellen Murphy? Can you make sure that's on, Ellen? Is there a button there? I'm sorry, I have no idea. Oh, you got it. Is that there it? There you go, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm here tonight to talk about the Gaza issue, the, the resolution that Veterans for Peace and many others had hoped would pass, and that's a moot point right now. But I still want to, I wanted to share some of my, my thoughts and why I, I was for that. I am still for that. We'll resubmit it, fix some words. Um, there have been two main I guess focuses of, of my life besides family. One is a chemical dependency therapist and one is a nonviolence practitioner and teacher. And interestingly, they both have the same thing as their central core. And that is being able to be a container for perceived opposites. In other words, in the chemical dependency part, it's I love you, I'm not your enemy, and I'm taking your keys. <laughs> And in the nonviolence part, it's stop, this is wrong, I will not cooperate, I'll try to stop you in every way I can. 
you are not my enemy, I love you, let's talk. So they both have this simple thing. And so I wanted to use my minute or so to thank the peace groups of Israel because they, under, they have the courage and the wholeness to understand this and to stand up and do this. I love my country and I'm going to speak out when it's wrong. So I want to thank Bet Salem, the Israeli Human Rights Information Center for Palestine, Gush Shalom, uh, they go and into the occupied territories and uh, visit people and write the reality that they see. Yesh Gavul, this is for uh, active duty Israeli soldiers who, refer, uh, who refuse to serve in the occupied territories and often go to prison. Yesh Gavul means there is a limit and they support these soldiers. The Israel Committee Against Home Demolitions, I believe that speaks for itself. Peace Now Israel, that's a general uh, peace organization trying to stop the, uh, the devastation on the Palestinian people. And finally, and there are many more, I just picked out these, the Israeli Rabbis for Human Rights. So my heart goes out to everyone, all the suffering, all the, uh, all the devastation, and my heart goes out to the Israeli peace activists and the Israeli refusing soldiers. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Pat McKee, followed by Jean Marks and Pearl Follett. Amen to that <coughs> last speaker. My name is Pat McKee. I live on Grant Street in uh, the Sunnyland neighborhood. Uh, I'm here tonight to speak about uh, the Sunnyland Neighborhood Plan Amendment, which you may vote on tonight. Uh, at, at the afternoon, at, I'm sorry, at the morning session, um, I did not place enough emphasis on the importance of uh, changing the staff proposal for a narrative description uh, of the new neighborhood plan for sub-area eight of the Sunnyland neighborhood. The um, staff proposal um, is essentially a, pro a promotional statement calling for high density infill on this uh, site, and that is not the neighborhood's vision. That is why I rewrote uh, the narrative description to be more in line with what the neighborhood had proposed. I realize that this is a compromise proposal, and I think the language which I submitted to you this morning uh, more reflects the neighborhood's uh, position on what this sub-area of our neighborhood, how this sub-area of our neighborhood should be developed. And in particular, I'm concerned about the use of the mixed qualifier, which staff is using uh, in their new plan. So in this narrative description, I have inserted a line which says, uh, multifamily forms, multifamily housing forms should not be mixed into this area. Um, I, I think that's important because when you step outside of the comprehensive plan into the zoning table, um, while they do specify only certain housing forms, they leave the possibility in the future of inserting multifamily housing using the mixed use qualifier uh, that they have um, in the zoning table. So, to give the neighborhood a little bit of reassurance, because you know that we have been um, fighting the introduction of multifamily housing into our neighborhood, and if that was done by the back door of using a mixed use qualifier, that, that is something that the neighborhood would not like to see. So please give serious consideration to the, to the rewrite of the narrative. And the other, the other point that I want to emphasize, this afternoon I tried to, tried to limit the uh, number of townhouses and cottage houses in order to see to it that um, a certain number of s traditional single-family detached houses were built on this site. I I've given uh, Councilman Knutson an, an example of a proposal that was put forward by Sunset <coughs> Commons in 2007 for this same sub-area eight. Their proposal uh, uses entirely townhouses, um, cottage houses and carriage houses without a single um, single family detached house on the site. And unless, unless you put in uh, some um, 
restriction on the number of cottage houses and townhouses, you might get absolutely no single family, traditional single family houses on the site. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Jean Marks, followed by Pearl Follett and Thelma Follett. Good evening, everybody. First of all, I'd like to uh, uh, thank the council, uh, thank the Madam Mayor for, uh, for bringing our resolution that what didn't make it through uh, the city council meeting as a whole, at least as far as the meeting of the whole this afternoon. I really appreciate uh, what you did to that point. When Veterans for Peace submitted to the city uh, council a resolution opposing the violence in Gaza and targeting of civilians, since then, casualties in the Gaza Strip have soared. And here at home, VFP members and supporters continue to be engaged in a much different conflict, one seeking to stifle debate by marginalizing anyone who emphasizes with the plight of Palestinian civilians, including over 400 children, guilty only of proximity to fields of fire, trapped in gales of shrapnel in the world's lar largest open-air prison. <laughs> While intractable right-wingers or bloodless neocons turn blind eyes to the humanitarian catastrophe, there are others still that regurgitate the tired, misdirected meme that this is well-intentioned measure, but it is not the business of city councils. If our city council, then whose? Our national representatives have opted out of this dialogue. They have campaigns to run in arms to reauthorize for the fifth largest military force in the world. On our tabs, by the way, at more than $11 million a day. Just dream along with me for a minute, will you? If our nation or enough local governments had opposed military intervention in Vietnam 50 years ago today, that one-sided slaughter might have been averted and nearly five million lives saved. And now that the Israel propaganda machine is misfiring with every hospital, UN shelter, or school that is demolished by the IDF, myths like embedded human shields in Israel's non-occupation are easily countered on the streets or in the local media. Worse, though, have been attempts to trump dialogue with the anti-Semitic playing card. It's easy enough to assert that religious or political Zionists are the real anti-Semites Semites, by just citing end time scripture or the rising tide of global anti-Semitism resulting from disproportionate retribution on Gaza. But it's far from tactical. Meanwhile, labeling dissenters like us of of the ongoing slaughter of innocents under siege as enemies of Israel or Zionists is a non sequitur. Wars have nothing to do with religion in this context, but rather land and people. People, not religions, are being attacked and slaughtered in Gaza. Muslims, Christians, and thousands of children. By the occupying nation's own admission, targeting civilians is a measured response, not merely expedient. And the fact that Israel calls itself a Jewish state doesn't exempt it from recognized international law, much less justifying suppression of our dissent or empathy for the dying on all sides. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean. Pearl Follett. Okay. On July 23rd, the United Nations Human Rights Council adopted a resolution to establish an independent international commission of inquiry to investigate all violations of international humanitarian law and international human laws in the occupied Palestinian territories. The United Nations Human Rights Council is responsible for protecting human rights around the world, which include protection from war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. War crimes are willfully causing great suffering or serious injury to body and health, intentionally directing attacks against the civilian population, intentionally directing attacks against hospitals and places where the sick and wounded are collected, we can call the crimes that Israel is committing on Palestinian civilians by their proper names, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. The United States, via its American ambassador, Keith Harper, cast a sole no vote on the UN's call for an investigation. This vote could have been severed the instrument by which these war crimes were investigated. Mr. Harper's vote is an injury to the now living and to all those who have come before to make America a nation where justice prevails and endures. The servicemen and service women who gave their last measure of devotion did not make their supreme sacrifice 
so that crimes against humanity would be hidden from justice. I ask the people, in the name of justice, to replace Mr. Keith Harthur. Our representative to the United States needs to support the principles for which we stand, freedom, liberty, and justice for all. Thank you, Pearl. Thelma Follett, followed by Judith Green and Janet Marino. So Thelma Follett and I live in Bellingham. When I came before you two weeks ago, 90 children had been brutally murdered by the Israel sp Israeli bombing of Gaza. Now, two weeks later, I said 200 more children have been killed, but Genius corrected me, so we're looking at 300, over 300 more children have been killed. Uh, the Israelis were able to kill 200 more children because when they ran out of ammunition, they asked the United States to replenish their stock. Shamefully, the President and all but one of our congressional representatives have been aiding and abetting Israel's war crimes. 80% of the 850 Palestinians murdered to date were non-combatants. Globally, the international arms industries, while telling us that they must manufacture and sell arms to protect us from terrorists, are actually a, um, using their weapons to kill 75% non-combatants. This is globally. Propaganda and spin has prevented us from actually realizing that fact and has also turned much of humanity into snarling barbarians. Recently, an Israeli parliament member encouraged the murder of Palestinian children, stating that they were snakes. <laughs> she said they should go, otherwise more little snakes would be raised. Is Israel's, uh, Israelis sat on their lawn chairs, we saw pictures of this, eating popcorn and cheering as the bombs dropped on Gaza, killing women, children, and animals. A recent Israeli blogger justified genocide since, he said, falsehood and deceit are part of the very fabric of who Palestinians are. He recommended that Israel obliterate them completely. Of course, the United States has a long history of demonizing the other. Our countrymen got away with murdering four million civilians in Vietnam because we were told that life is cheap in the Orient. How is it that we cannot, that we citizens of the world have been imposed upon to such an extent that we actually either clamor for or condone in silence that most unnatural of acts, the brutal killing, maiming, and orphaning of children? In the best tradition of 1984, we are the victims of carefully controlled propaganda and brainwashing. Our consent, silence, or outright vocal hatred is deliberately manufactured by the corporate-controlled media through lies, omissions, and the trivializing of the most inhumane and horrendous deeds. Recently, NBC repeated the outright lie of the Director General of the Israel Civil Aviation Authority that the Is Israel Missile Defense System Iron Dome was not 99% effective, when in reality it intercepts less than 5% of all of the rockets fired from Gaza. This media lie and others like it bought American silence from Chuck Hagel, our defense secretary, and you can read the rest. Thank you. Thank you, Thelma. Judith Green, followed by Janet Marino and Michael Jacobson. Good evening. My name is Judith Green. Uh, let's see. This, this afternoon at the uh, meeting that I attended with the committee, uh, there was no, nobody addressed, addressed one of the issues of the neighborhood, which is where is the traffic going to go? Um, it's, there's a chart and it says that um, cars will not be able to go through the whole property, like from Sunset to Illinois, but it's important to the neighborhood that we don't have all this traffic from, you know, 35 plus units going through the neighborhood. So I would like to propose that you tighten up that language and make sure that there's a substantial amount of traffic that's going to go on to sunset. And you'll have to make whatever changes you need to do to make that <coughs> viable and feasible. But you know, that's one of the objections that we've all had from the beginning is, you know, how all that traffic from development will be going through the neighborhood. So I'm asking 
you to look at that and put some language into the um, proposal that you adopt. Um, I was also chagrined that you didn't address the, I didn't hear anything about the Growth Management Act, and I just want to bring it to your attention once again that um, the intent is to um, have the neighbor, any development be in keeping with neighborhood character. I didn't hear that addressed at all. Um, I was really surprised that everyone just said, you know, Jack brought up about, oh, well, 35 and 28, not too much different. Let's just go with 35, and everybody just said, okay, yeah, let's go with 35. But that's not also not counting the number of um, ADUs that are allowed in the housing types. Um, I, I do um, support um, that using the toolkit because there are um, design standards. I think that's a good idea. Um, let's see. So I guess I would like to see some, some number that addresses how many um, ADUs are going to be allowed. And also, I want to know that um, it will be enforced because they're supposed to be owner-occupied in one of, the, one of the buildings, either the ADU or the, um, the, the house. And I, I, as far as I can tell, there's no enforcement in place. And I mean, it's on the books, but it's not, in fact, enforced. Well, that was fast. <laughs> Thank you, Judith. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Janet Marino, followed by Michael Jacobson and Dean Tuckerman. My name is Janet Marino, and I'm the Executive Director at Whatcom Peace and Justice Center. I'm going to abbreviate my comments because a lot of it's been covered here. I first wanted to thank uh, Councilmember Borneman for bringing our resolution forward. Um, I really appreciate it, and there's, there's uh, no match for, for bringing your conscience before everyone else, even though you know you're going to take some heat for it. So thank you. I admire that. Um, you received a letter from me, I think on Friday, which had a pretty extensive list of peace groups, both in Israel, Palestine, and the U.S., and a number of the ones mentioned by Ellen were on there. And I'd like to encourage you to take a little time and explore those peace groups. That's where my heart lies. Um, I'm about to, I, I think I also told you a little bit about the guests we hosted in April, um, Professor Alarir and his two students, for their nonviolent project, Gaza Writes Back. They traveled all over the U.S. presenting their book, which were fiction and nonfiction stories by Gazan youth who were looking for a way to express, express their pain and, the, and their passion in a nonviolent manner. And unfortunately, Professor Alarir has lost nine members of his immediate family, eight members on his wife's side and his own brother, who was a children's television celebrity, and the young student, uh, Yusuf, who we hosted, lost his best childhood friend in the shelling in Gaza. So I, I'm particularly affected by this um, because I'm friends with them on Facebook and I got to watch it in real time. But what I'm I'd like to do is tie this to why it's important for city council to take this into consideration. I'm about to go drop this in the box, and on this ballot is a former city council member who is now running for Senate. There may be a time when some of you who are not so close to retirement may run for higher office. And this is an opportunity for you to educate yourselves in a way that I don't think anyone in office right now is willing to do. So please don't think that this doesn't matter. There are some of you who may go out of here. Uh, Congress, Congresswoman Murphy may have the opportunity to vote someday, or Senator Lil Lilquist may have the opportunity to vote today, someday on whether or not we're going to continue to spend 8.5 to $11 million per day of U.S. tax money to support the Israeli occupation of Gaza. So thank you for your time and thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Council Member Borneman, for what you've done. And I hope that you go out here and do some more reading and, and form a, an opinion of your own. I won't even tell you what that opinion needs to be because I know you're all highly intelligent individuals and you'll come to the right conclusion on your own. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Michael, <coughs> folks, <coughs> thank you. We don't. Uh, encourage applause or booze so that we can create a safe atmosphere for everyone to share their opinion freely. Thank you. Next up is Michael Jacobson, followed by Dean Tuckerman and Maggie Low Kemper. Hello, my name is Michael Jacobson, and I'd like to show you a, a graphic that will present to you <clears throat> says says quite a bit. On the left is 
<clears throat> the area of Palestine in roughly 1917. And what you see on the right side in green, the progression in green is uh, Israeli territory. I would guess that there's uh, less than 20% of the land uh, is Palestinian. And of those lands, they're basically open air prisons completely surrounded. Israel talks about being surrounded by Arab countries. The Palestinians are surrounded. <clears throat> I worked in a prison for six years as a mental health therapist <clears throat> with high-risk criminals. I've heard every preposterous rationalization one could possibly imagine to justify their heinous crimes. The justifications given by world leaders are virtually identical, only their crimes are of an astronomical scale and their indefensible excuses are designed by master propagandists. Extreme Zionist leaders of Israel excuse the slaughter of innocent civilians but deny any responsibility. It's just not acceptable for a nation to justify the slaughter of nearly 400 children and the serious wounding of another 4,600. <clears throat> Such rationalizations devoid of any, crim uh, any common humanity are the mental machinations of war criminals. And I am ashamed sometimes of my species. Perpetrators of abuse conjure up everything they can, can to gain sympathy and support for their crimes, as Israel has done in claiming self-defense, portraying themselves as victims. Israel is not a victim. In Bellingham, Veterans for Peace members have been accused of being anti-Semitic, even though our mission is one of nonviolence and the eventual abolition of war. Don't blame Veterans for Peace for anti-Semitism. Blame the fanatic government of Israel. They are not peace-loving Jews. They are extremists who are bent on the total destruction of all of Palestine and have been working in that direction for decades. And the map that I showed you should demonstrate that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Dean Tuckerman. <clears throat> members of the council, members of the public, hi. There was, when I, when I first started activism, there was a slogan, not to decide is to decide. And I'm going to speak on two different issues that you don't have to decide on tonight. That there's, I'm going to speak on Gaza and I'm going to speak on PSE. Neither of those are within your direct charter. But not dealing with both of those would be wrong. And I'm going to begin with Gaza. Gaza, and I'm going to watch my time so I get to speak on both of them. <laughs> Gaza, it's very simple. I mean, I, I, I almost always begin, it's very simple. But it is. People are, there is a massacre going on. Children are dying by the hundreds. There is, hospitals are being bombed. There is no question as to who is the aggressor. I am Jewish. I still feel that Israel at this point is the aggressing party and needs to be condemned. I feel that strongly, and no matter what your position is on different on, on other parts of it, no matter what your position is on on what the land should look like afterwards, after this is over, no matter what your position is on whether Jews should be there, on whether the Palestinians were attacked in the beginning, whether Jews, 
whether this is Jewish land, Palestinian land, Israel should be condemned for its massacres. And it's hard to move on to something else after saying that. It's really hard, but I'm going to try to anyway. I think the issue of coal strip, the issue of the PSE and coal-free PSE is very, the world, I mean, I've spoken about this before. The world needs, doesn't need any more fossil fuel. It doesn't need any more coal. It doesn't need, and I think you need, we need to, to make coal strip, which is the area, it's very weird, it's called coal strip, which is the area that it is. We need to make it a, you make it alternative energy and make alternative energy real energy. Thank, Thank you, you, Dean. <clears throat> Next up, Maggie Lowkemper followed by Eric Bostrom and Carolyn De Silva. I'd like to thank the council for not taking that resolution on Gaza up. I think it was a wise thing to do. But I am a Jew, and all I hear is about Israel this, Israel that, Israel's guilty, but you never hear about what Hamas does, what the Palestinians do. You never hear that. You don't hear the thousands of rockets that the Hamas land on Israel every single day, up to 3,000 per day, and how they use their own children. These are the Palestinians and the Hamas who use their own children as shields. As a matter of fact, today, a Finnish reporter took pictures of a Hamas militant shooting out a rocket from a Gaza hospital top, from a hospital. So of course, the hospital is going to be targeted because of what this Hamas militant did. It's, so Israel doesn't attack the children, it doesn't directly or, or, or indirectly in the sense that they don't target them. What they do is they target the militants, and where are the militants? Surrounded by children. In schools, you'll find, the, you'll find all, the, all the military rockets from the Hamas. And so Israel has to defend itself. Israel is a tiny country surrounded by enemies. And Israel has every right to defend itself. And I admire Prime Minister Netanyahu for what he is doing. He is doing the right thing in defending Israel because Hamas has said that they will not be happy until all Jews are exterminated completely from Israel, and Israel will fly the flag of the Hamas. This is the Hamas. These are the militants that, oh, that are saying, you'll see them in the news. If anybody is smart, they'll look at their news, and you'll see the actual Hamas individual speaking. Even the, the son of the Hamas leader, the founder of the leader, said that they're nothing but militants and murderers. The own son called his father a murderer. Because he said that he wanted nothing to do with Hamas or any of those militants because of all the atrocities that they are doing to their own people and then blaming the Jews. And this is the son of the Hamas leader who said that. He was on TV saying that. So everybody blames Israel. I don't. I commend Israel because Israel has every right to survive, every right to defend itself. I have family that died in the Holocaust, so I know what it's like to defend yourself. Because even nowadays, you'll find a lot of anti-Semitism. Even the people who say are not anti-Semitic, their words defy their mendacious claim. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Maggie. Eric Bostrom, followed by Carolyn De Silva and Jacob Sayer. <clears throat> I'm a little, <clears throat> a little tall for this here. Well, thank you, council and folks. Uh, I feel like a minority in this Hamas discussion, aside from the eloquent lady you just heard. Um, I'm a, a longtime Bellingham resident and voter and pastor. And I think after tonight, I'm getting inspired to become a conservative activist. Uh, but I'm here uh, in regards to the 
resolution opposing the violence in Gaza and targeting civilians. Um, I feel that there's a whole lot of misinformation or deceit. I don't know which it is, but it's something that adds up to be not true. There's, it says targeting of civilians. Well, the only target is the rockets. And the only uh, other target is to break up all those tunnels that go under, under Israel so that the, the uh, Hamas can go in there and steal people and blow up things. Israel is a very small country, about 8,000 square miles, size of New Jersey. And if you put it up here in the corner of Washington State, could you imagine if Canadians were just like the Hamas and they dug tunnels underneath the border through Blaine and they sent 7,000 rockets a year into Bellingham. I don't think some of you people would have the same view if that was true because it would affect you. And guess what? Hamas wants to come further. They don't want to just leave Israel. They want to go beyond Israel. They would like to come here. And so uh, I think this issue is more serious than we think. And I believe that a lot of the people who don't speak up are afraid to speak up that, that really know the truth. And so as a result, many of the people voice opinions who don't really represent Bellingham. They may represent themselves. But I applaud the, what the council said. I don't know what all of you believe. I don't know what the whole city believes, but I know one thing. If you would have passed this, you wouldn't have been representing me, and you wouldn't have been representing many people that I know. It's amazing that Harry Reid, who I'm not a fan of Harry Reid, but even Harry Reid is in favor of uh, Israel defending itself. The Senate passed a resolution just last week, Resolution 526, and Harry Reid and Mitch McConnell, who normally don't agree on too much, actually agreed on this one thing, to, uh, to say that Israel should have the right to defend itself. And I believe that it does. It's about two things, rockets and tunnels. And what about the Israeli children? Nobody talks about the Israeli children. We say there's not as many that were killed. Well, yeah, but they still were. And, and the Israel just, they, have, they defend themselves very well. But just because you have less people killed doesn't mean you're more guilty. Just because you have more people killed doesn't mean that you're guilty. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Carolyn De Silva. I want to thank Eric. He, um, he's made my, my talk a little shorter. And... Um, I'm going to speak just as a mother and a, a human being, I guess, and forget all that other stuff. Uh, I realize that's an oversimplification, but that's where I am right now. So I'm not going to um, give you the statistics again. You've heard all of that. You know pretty much what's going on. So um, Gazans are on a tiny slice of land trying to survive without electricity, without adequate water food and sanitation, without safe shelter, and without means of escape. They are innocent, vulnerable civilians, and their precarious existence right now is hellish, to say the least. The war leaves little time for individual grief and memorial because the bombings and deaths will continue the next day and the day after that. We read of the numbers killed and wounded, measured reports that do little to make the horror real to us who are so far away. The images, however, can break your heart. Politics and religion should carry no weight here. There's no purpose to this kind of suffering and no outcome of this war that could possibly justify it. It's wrong under any microscope and it has to stop. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Carolyn. Jacob Sayer, followed by Pamela Hinton and Charles Law. Um, hello, my name is Jacob Sager. I live in Bellingham, Washington, and I am a student at Western Washington University. I'd like to begin with uh, describing a act, military action that took place 10 years ago 
this was Operation Phantom Fury. It was the operation launched by the United States and coalition forces against Al-Qaeda and Ba'athist insurgents in the city of Fallujah in Iraq. This operation lasted for a month from around November through December of 2004, and during that time period, while the United States and its allies were fighting Al-Qaeda, over 800 civilians, according to the Red Cross, were killed. Now, that's not an indictment against the United States military. That is an indictment of the horror and how horrible and hard it is to fight against a fanatical death cult like Al-Qaeda while simultaneously trying to protect your, the lives of your own men, while simultaneously trying to prevent innocent civilians from being killed, while fighting in a closed urban space. Now, just as I'm sure that the city council would never pass a resolution condemning the United States military for the civilians who unfortunately are killed in, while fighting against the forces of international terrorism, either in Afghanistan or Iraq, or the civilians who have been killed in US drone strikes against Al Qaeda targets. So I believe sincerely that it is wrong to condemn the state of Israel and the men and women of the Israeli Defense Forces for conducting themselves in a similar manner to the United States. United States forces while trying to protect their entire civilian population from the same forces of international terror and the same forces that would inflict a catastrophic genocide on all Jews, not just in Israel, but all over the world. The difference is, while the American people do not live in close proximity to the forces of terrorism based in countries like Iraq and Syria and in many other countries, Israel doesn't have that luxury. Israel is the country where if a rocket is fired from Gaza at the, a southern city like Ashkelon or the town of Sterot, which is right on the border, you have 10 to 15 seconds to find shelter a land where even a ch child's playground has been turned into a bomb shelter. And this is rooted in the fact that for since 2001, and especially since the disengagement from Gaza by the Israel in 2005, there have been tens of thousands of rockets. Each rocket, each mortar is a war act of aggression, an act of war against every Israeli civilian. And it is dangerous and it is naive and it is wrong to imagine that the state of Israel would not respond in some way eventually. Now, recently, the great Israeli novelist and peace activist Amos Oz gave an interview to a German agency, and he explained the difference in their worldview. He said that many Western peace groups view war as the ultimate evil, but from the Israeli peace perspective, it is aggression uh, that is evil. And to be frank, you are allowed to, yourself to defend yourself from aggression, and I would urge the city council to reject this one-sided, unfair, and patently inaccurate resolution and any others. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Pamela Hinton. Wow, I feel like taking a minute. I love Israel, I'll put it out there. Excuse me? Sure. Um, and I have very good friends who live over there and so hearing all of this is kind of, it's, you know, very real. So hang on just a second. Okay. I'm here to talk about Sunnyland. <laughs> My name's Pamela Hinton. Um, I've lived in Whatcom County for the last 25 years. My husband Greg was born and raised here and we raised our family here. My children are third generation Whatcom County and our partners in um, Sunset Commons, which owns uh, the property between Illinois and Sunset, are also longtime Bellingham residents. Um, and the reason why I explain that is because uh, we're not going anywhere. And, and what we're doing on that property really matters to us. We want to do something impactful that benefits the community, that benefits the neighborhood, that everybody can be happy with. And when we um, took ownership of this property, it's actually been nine years and five months ago. I know some people think it was seven years, but it's actually been nine years and five months ago. We were really excited about the possibilities of doing something with what we considered this kind of diamond of the rough, large, vacant, ugly parking lot. Um, and really the city encouraged us to be uh, I guess, um, creative in what we 
thought might work there, and we entered into a long, um, kind of arduous process with the neighbors and the city in coming up with something that would, that would work. We met with the neighbors, we went to the meetings, um, we did what we thought was appropriate to reach an agreement on this property. And um, I guess what I'm, what I'm hoping you, the members of the council and Mayor Linville will consider tonight is our proposal that we set before you, I believe July 30th. Um, which is a, what we consider to be a wonderful compromise between what the city wants in density and what the neighborhood wants in keeping kind of a, a similar type um, neighborhood atmosphere. So, um, so we as Sunset Commons agreed to 35 units, which I think makes sense. It, it fills that density that you're looking for. And then the neighborhood wants the single family housing along Illinois, which we're, we're good with also. Um, so we're hoping you'll seriously consider the compromise that we proposed because it would be a solution tonight. We're so close. I mean, when we're talking about um, some of the things that have been brought up, we're, we're so close. Um, to, to coming up with something that would work for everybody. So I'm really hopeful that you will consider what we proposed. Um, wow, time's up. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all tonight. Thank you, Pamela. Charles Law, followed by Carol Follett and Corey Ertel. Good evening, I'm Charles Law. Uh, I was gonna speak on the affordable housing and fair housing and this has been for me a very emotional uh, meeting this evening and first of all and I would like to also before I make any statement at all I'd like to acknowledge the Coast Salish people Lummi, Nooksack tribes that have had major ceremonies uh, festivals, gift giving, before contact right here in Whatcom County. Uh, you know, we're looking at, uh, and I've heard numbers, I've heard uh, excerpts from Fox News, I've heard uh, stories from the liberal media, and it looks like we're just looking at numbers. We're looking at, well, there's 56 soldiers, Israeli soldiers have been killed. Over 400 uh, civilians, uh, children have been killed. It's, it's, you know, war is not a game of numbers. Uh, war is serious. And I think until we sit down and, and, and go over our differences, uh, left or right or center, uh, this is going to continue. It, this is just one small portion of what's going to happen later on in our lives. Uh, uh, one of the ladies mentioned that we might have a Councilwoman Murphy, we might have a, a Senator Lilliquist. We might not have anything if we keep doing what we're doing. There's a lot of people out here that are saying, uh, you know, uh, Israel has a right to exist. Uh, people on the other side are saying that uh, Palestine needs to, to uh, uh, get their lands back. We need, we need to sit down together I, and, and talk this out instead of bombing each other for, for reasons that just don't make any sense to me at all. I mean, we know that Israel has a right to exist. We know Palestine has a right to exist. Let's get together. Let's quit this argument. Let's sit down, stop this warring, with, and, and sit down and talk. Talk it out. I'm, I'm just... War and, and, and violence never leads to anything but war, more war and more violence. Thank you, Charles. Carol Follett. Thank you, Charles pretty much said why I'm here this evening, um, because to be silent about this continuous slaughter um, would be to be without conscience. Um, and I'm here as a citizen, as a community member, to say I, I am really 
I, I don't want to see any more children murdered in our names, with our money, with our resources. We have to talk. Um, I don't understand. This has been going on for so many years. For most of my life, I have, I have read about this. Um, we have the comfort to sit here and talk about how we're going to redesign our neighborhoods or not when there are children who are suffering um, with shrapnel, who have been murdered, whose parents have been murdered, who have had all of their resources blown out from underneath them. It is insane. There is no reason. There is no justification. There has never been. Human beings beings have got to be civilized. And as Charles said, if we don't, we're losing it. I actually um, have done some research about propaganda because I am just astounded at how we have gotten here, how we can calmly talk about this, why the world doesn't come to a standstill when we hear and read about these children being murdered. Uh, it's unacceptable. So um, basically, uh, I've been studying about the propaganda and how we have been prepared to receive this information. Um, I'm trying to cut it short. Uh, to quote one reporter who's not in the lying game, each time Israel attacks Gaza and massacres its trapped civilian population, at the end of 2008, in the fall of 2012, now again this past month, the same process repeats itself in both the U.S. media and government circles. The U.S. government feeds Israel the weapons it uses and steadfastly defends its aggression both publicly and at the U.N. The U.S. Congress unanimously enacts one resolution after the next to support and enable Israel, and then American media figures pretend that the Israeli attack has nothing to do with their country. So how is this unbelievable cycle given the appearance of consent from the citizens of our country? The ground has been prepared by the euphemistically named Israel Project's 2009 Global Language Dictionary or Playbook. This tells its readers to focus on the persuadables, that is all Americans who are not part of the Amen Choir. This persuasion is needed to ensure American consent for financial and tactical military aid. We have to be persuaded. It is in our best interest to forego housing, education, employment, sustainable energy, and defer dealing with the worst financial hardship hardship in our country since the Depression, to pay for the elimination of a group of people who have been occupied through no fault of their own for the past 50 or 60 years. And I just have to say aside, I know there are atrocities everywhere. It makes no sense to me. I have no idea how we got in this situation, and it seems that we could reasonably get ourselves out of it. Please just read what I submitted. Thank you, Carol. Corey Ertel followed by Jack Swanson and Linda Twitchell. Good evening, City Council. Uh, my name is Corey Ertel, and I'm a Community Services Manager with Puget Sound Energy. Um, and I work alongside Lynn Murphy and Dama Moore, who you may, may know. Unfortunately, they could not be here tonight. Um, real quickly, I just wanted to introduce uh, Raylan Asa, who is our new uh, Municipal Liaison Manager, and will be a primary point of contact for the city on uh, operational issues and projects moving forward. Um, I just wanted to share that PSC shares the council's views on environmental stewardship, renewable energy, uh, energy affordability, and reliability, and will continue to work with the communities we serve to balance all of these important objectives. The issue of ceasing coal use is complex, and the timeline is difficult to project. As part of the resource review process, PSC submits plans to the UTC that outlines the energy resources that best balance the public's interests with overall demand for energy. On behalf of our customers, including the City of Bellingham, we're exploring those opportunities to make such a transition possible. Um, PSC is a national leader in renewable energy, including being the second largest utility owner of wind generation in all of the United States. Yet energy supply must also be balanced by its demand. So PSC has initiatives that help offset those impacts. Uh, and there's some key opportunities for the City of Bellingham and other communities that we serve. Uh, including uh, our green power program, which supports local renewable energy projects. As of today, there's nearly 5,000 residential and commercial green power customers in Bellingham, which is very impressive, and it's second only to the city of Olympia and all of our service territory. Uh, a small business direct install program will be taking place later this month in Bellingham, which will uh, benefit a vast majority of Bellingham businesses uh, with its target towards <laughs> small business. PSC has teamed up with the city of Bellingham on the Georgetown University Energy Prize which will stimulate competition between cities across the country for energy use reduction. 
Um, PSC supports customer-owned solar installation projects with expertise and net metering programs for both residential and commercial customers. And there's been tremendous support for solar programs here in Bellingham, including 318 customers. Um, PSC and Bellingham are currently exploring uh, district energy options, and we look forward to the potential partnership uh, in that regard. PSC is also looking at new technologies such as large battery storage that will support renewable generation and in some cases reliability improvements in our area. And we're happy to update the council um, on an ongoing basis uh, on a current project of this nature in Glacier. So I say all that just to, to demonstrate that where the city of Bellingham is looking at future energy options, PSC is right there to partner with the city and we're proud of that and we're excited. Um, so with that, I just would say thanks for the opportunity to comment tonight, and we welcome the City of Bellingham's engagement with PSE to make this transition possible. So thank you very much. Thank you, Corey. Jack Swanson. Uh, Jack Swanson, 900 DuPont. I hope you're not completely numb at this point. It's been a long haul. Okay, a little bit about me. Um, most of you know me as an attorney who works in land use areas, but I also have a bachelor's degree in economics, and I also have a year of graduate school, and I probably would have had the second year of graduate school if the draft board hadn't given me my draft notice back in 1966. Uh, both Bill Geyer and I have submitted new materials that you haven't seen, and they were delivered to you by email, and you have them in front of you, I hope. Uh, and I want to be sure that you get a chance to take a look at those before you decide what you're going to do with the Sunset Commons zoning proposal. Okay, the recession. Long, slow time getting out of the recession. Normally, recessions are, the way out of recessions are led by the housing sector. That hasn't happened this time. Uh, why not? Uh, one reason is overregulation and higher costs. The costs of a house are divided into basically fixed costs and variable costs. The fixed cost is the lot, the entitlements, the permits, the, fi the, the financing. Um, and uh, the greater the fixed cost, the higher the overall cost, the higher required investment, the greater equity required by lenders, and the greater cost you end up with for the final product. Um, vendors won't finance unless they get proper ratios. That's why you see bigger houses all the time, because if the lots are super expensive, then the lender expects you to have a house that's maybe three times the cost of the lot. So bam, you got a $450,000 house, in, a, in a, a city where the uh, median incomes aren't high enough to afford anything like that. Okay, finally, what, what about interest rates? Imagine if interest rates were higher. <clears throat> They're unprecedentedly low, which makes one think that people ought to be out there eager to go develop things. Not so. Uh, but imagine what happens when the Fed finally gets around to letting interest rates go higher and we start paying the debt on that $17 trillion of debt that we have what, what is going to happen to potential home builders at that point? The extra regulations, the extra cost and all that stuff is going to make it even more difficult for those people to actually conduct business here in Bellingham. Now, um, the overregulation idea, uh, the, in, in this case that you're working with here, the extra regulations you propose are only going to affect the local builders who have put their life's work into Bellingham and have demonstrated that they are competent and and worthy builders and worthy to have for some trust, okay? The, the other people won't be here. They aren't here now, really. They won't be here because they don't have to be. They can spend their money down the street in Mount Vernon or somewhere else, and they can get by without the extra cost involved in some of the things that you're asking our local builders to do, and they'll simply stay away. And I can speak from personal experience that I've watched people walk out of my office and get in their car and leave, rather than put themselves in that position. Can I give you a reading list for, uh, you should read The Wall. John Hershey wrote it, I think. It's like 50 years old. You should read Exodus, and you should read uh, Beirut to Tel Aviv by Friedman, the guy who writes for the New York Times. Thanks, Jack. Take a look at those. Linda Twitchell, followed by Ken Holmes and uh, J. Peter Vanderveen. I'm Linda Twitchell. I'm here speaking for the Building Industry Association of Whatcom County. And I'm here to talk about 
uh, Sunset Commons, for anyone at home who isn't aware of it, it's a four acre parcel, a single parcel right now, on Sunset uh, next to the Greek Orthodox Church. Um, we are tonight looking at uh, basically the Sunnyland Neighborhood Association proposal on this as amended by the planning staff with some changes. One of the things that is included in this proposal is a requirement, a limitation that the only housing forms considered can be some of the housing forms in the infill toolkit. Now the BIA has for a long time been promoting use of the infill toolkit in single family zones. We really think if you're serious about trying to get the people who moved to Whatcom County to live in Bellingham, we're gonna have to use this. But allowing use of it is very different from requiring use. In this case, we have a single entity who owns one parcel, and the city, if you adopt the proposal that is under consideration right now, would be dictating to that particular group involving a what is currently a single parcel of land, here are your options, here's what you have to do with it. Uh, one of the arguments in favor of requiring, not allowing, but requiring use of the infill toolkit is that it involves design standards. If the Sunnyland community is seriously concerned about lack of design standards, let's consider for a moment that these design standards are not going to be required anywhere else in Sunnyland. If you buy a house there and you remodel or you take it down and you rebuild, you can do anything you want in terms of style, etc. Is it fair, is it good policy to require one property owner to apply standards like this to one piece of property if we're not extending it elsewhere? If we need design standards in Sunnyland, why isn't the Neighborhood Association proposing that they be applied to the entire neighborhood? In general, we would discourage you from requiring the infill toolkit. I think it's a great idea to allow its use, but I think when someone owns a piece of property, they need to have the ability to develop it as they believe is appropriate and that the, the, the customers will, will go for. So that's the gist of it. Thank you much. Thank you, Linda. Ken Holmes? <clears throat> the off-campus student life survey sponsored by WWU. And uh, I think there are just an awful lot of problems with it. it. But a lot of people keep referring to it as if it was some outstanding uh, method survey that just, uh, you know, you can't touch it. Well, I'd like to point out a couple of things. When it comes down to percentages of that survey, 27.6% were juniors, 42.8% were seniors at 70.4%, 10.7% were fifth year, 22 were grad students, add those up, that's 83.3%. If you have 83% of those people, they're not even there now. So how does your survey hold any water when the people that were in that survey no longer are there? When you look at the survey, the people said noise, theft, parking. Nobody pointed out the big deal to them was that the safety of the interior of the dwelling was a big problem. There were a couple things mentioned. But that wasn't their, their big item. Landlord tenants, average, good, excellent, 97.5% of the people who filled out the survey said it was average, good, or excellent. So that only leaves 2.5%. Uh, there's a redundance mentioning mold every time you turn around. That's been addressed here already. Cracks and leaks. 
I think I got some cracks and leaks at home myself, but they're not some big deal. Uh, access to affordable laundry. Since when did it become a legal requirement the landlord has to provide laundry, let alone affordable. Now, I tell you, in my own mind, I listen to the people and their arguments, and this is a Trojan horse. <clears throat> people are not that concerned about the interior of those buildings. They want to see the inside of them. But when you get down to it, this ordinance does not do anything about safety. I believe when you listen to people's comments, it comes down to controlling students off campus. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. J. Peter Vanderveen, followed by Bill Geyer and Ali Tazy. <clears throat> Good evening, I'm Peter van der Wien. When after World War II, many Germans were asked why they didn't stand up for justice and human rights, protested against, why didn't they protest against their government when they saw what was happening, many Germans said, we haven't es nicht gewusst, we have not known it. My mother, and several other close relatives were among the thousands who died in concentration camps. But we have the chance now, we know what's going on. We see the pictures on TV, but we hear the suffering. I'm thankful and I want to express my gratitude to the local chapter of Veterans for Peace that they're helping us to stand up for justice, human rights, and peace. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Phil Geyer, followed by Ali Tazy and Karen Wheel. <clears throat> Good evening, council members. For the record, Bill Geyer, 1008 16th Street. Uh, here tonight to um, uh, speak on behalf of the uh, agenda bill you'll be looking at later, that is the Sunset Commons property uh, rezone. I handed in to the clerk, and I hope the council has received as well, a letter that we have, and um, bringing your attention to a couple things. Um, the current proposal that's before you from both the Sunnyland neighborhood and also from the staff really does not address nor meet the goals you have set in the infill, residential infill requirements in the Bellingham Comprehensive Plan. If either one of them is adopted, including the staff's proposal that we looked at at the committee today, um, you really, really will not see anything built on the site. It, it won't happen. And let me address a couple things, a couple points to that. I'm going to use my uh, right honorable friend here, Mr. Knudsen. I forgot to put the address. I did. I did it on purpose, sir, but I believe you can still be found. Okay. Mr. Knudsen owns a house, full disclosure, that I built in the Barkley Grove subdivision, 2002-2003 vintage. Uh, that house is uh, 1,672 square feet on a 4,817 square foot lot. And as the council members are familiar, when you do a floor area ratio calculation, that is square footage of house to the lot, that's 0.34. Now, why that's important is the staff is recommending the infill toolkit components, a limited component of it, that would allow for um, houses but it would not allow for Mr. Knutson's house to be built on the Sunset Commons property. For example, the staff wants smaller houses on an 1,800 to a 3,000 square foot lot with a floor area ratio of 0.4. That is, the house would be 720 square feet to 1,200 square feet total livable space, but only 600 square feet per the regulations are allowed on the main floor, so it has to be at least a two-story house. Staff also wants small houses on 3,000 to 5,000 square foot lots, larger than Mr. Knudsen's, with a floor area ratio of 0.35, and the house would be 1,050 to 1,750 square feet, but again, a maximum of 800 square feet on the main floor. Again, the house has to be two stories. Our main concern here is this is not the preferred housing type for a growing proportion of our Bellingham market retired individuals, heads of house, older heads of household, and those that are not as ambulatory or independent. That's a significant portion of our population. We believe that Sunset Commons can build housing to serve that. We would ask you to look at the compromise that we have provided to you tonight. 
the letter that we provided to you on July 30 really did not get to consideration this morning by the committee. We would ask that you give the full diligent review of it tonight before you take any action on the agenda bill. We believe that as you look at the details of what we've provided, uh, it is a, a, a residential single designation. It provides flexibility in the regulations. We believe it also provides, as you know, a process for approval through the hearing examiner's uh, office. And that will provide for the type of solution you need to A, meet your goals on density, and B, meet uh, quality design. Thank you. We'll be here tonight, should you have any questions. And my this morning. This morning. Well, tonight. Yeah, whenever it is. But thank you, Mr. Knutson, for serving that. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. Holly Tazy, followed by Karen Wheel and Yoshi Ravel. And if there's anyone else who would like to speak, please do get up now and line up at the door there. I'm not going to ask again after that. <clears throat> Good evening, council members. Ali Taishi, 1708 F Street. Um, I'll be brief. I am here to just speak to you about the two uh, docketing proposals that you have before you, other than the proposal that you heard about earlier for the church property. I'm representing the applicants for the Ashley Street rezone and the Samish Way rezone. And I'm just here to encourage the full council to uh, vote to dock at both those proposals tonight. I understand that the planning committee earlier today uh, made a recommendation to do so. Both the planning commission and the uh, staff that have worked on this have both made that recommendation. And so I'd just like to encourage you to, to move forward and allow us to engage in that process. And we look forward to talking to staff about this. We look forward to talking to the neighborhood and other interested parties and finding a way to get these properties zoned so that they can be developed and contribute to housing in Bellingham. Um, and I'd also like to just reiterate a statement I made a couple weeks ago when we saw you, which is that I'd really appreciate if you evaluated each of these proposals on their own individual merits. You've heard about this property across the street and I'm sure you'll hear more about it and you've seen written comment about it and we just want to make sure that, that you evaluate our proposal on Samish on its own merits. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Alan. Karen Wheel, followed by Yoshi Ravel, and then Diane Foster, and Bob Baird Levine, and then that's the end of our list. No, Karen? Okay, we'll go on to Yoshi. Uh, hi, members of the audience and staff, uh, members of City Council, Madam Mayor. Uh, my name is Yoshi Ravel. I've listened tonight, and I didn't come to speak about this, but I had to say something. Um, one side wants to blame Hamas, and the other side wants to blame Israel. And my answer is yes. I blame both sides. Israel has lost its own children. I see the soldiers as children. The Palestinians have lost people on their side. Who do I blame? I blame both sides. There are no winners in war, never. Both sides lose. Both sides have injured. Both sides suffer misery. Both sides have death. There are no winners in war. As was stated earlier, the only way we can get through this is if both sides have the courage to sit with each other and say, oh my goodness, we both have children and we both care about our families. What I actually came here to speak about was the homeless. And I've said this before, but I'll say it again. Um, we are the homeless. I don't care how big your house is, how many thousands of square feet it is, you're homeless. If there are homeless people living on the streets and living in the parks, we are all homeless. There is no escaping that. We're connected. If we don't take care of the homeless, we're not truly taking care of ourselves. And the homeless, regardless of the fact that they ask for money, they don't really want our money. What they want is our love and our respect. They want to see in our eyes, I care about you as a homeless person. I respect you as a person. I see that you have a heart like I do. 
and I want the best for you like I want the best for me. I thank you all for allowing me to share that, and I wish you all a pleasant evening. Thank you. Thank you, Yoshi. Diane Foster, followed by Bob Baird Levine. Let's see. Hello. Um, I'm not as well prepared as the eloquent speakers from Veterans for Peace, but I just want to say that I do support the resolution they introduced and the courage that it took to do that. Um, my father uh, was shot down at age 19 over Nazi Germany and was in a POW camp and was uh, severely mentally injured from that. Um, he believed in fighting fascism. Um, he didn't necessarily believe that Israel should punish the Palestinians for what the Germans did um, and that they deserve to have a homeland but not to displace someone else to do it. Um, and that the Palestinians have been trying to get their homeland back ever since. And they don't have $11 million a day in uh, gigantic missiles to do that with. Now, I don't blame, uh, I mean, I don't support Hamas in their violent means. Um, and both sides sh should sit down to negotiate, but it's so uneven at this point because the Israelis do have the U.S. Uh, financial support on their side. So uh, until we deal with those lobbyists in APAC, there won't be any uh, equality on both sides. So thank you for listening. And I do appreciate your at least listening and trying to bring on the resolution. And I understand that it would have been kind of a nightmare for you in terms of how controversial it would have been. So thank you. Thank you, Diane. Bob Baird Levine. And then if there's anyone else who would like to speak, please do line up right now. Thank you. Bob Beard Levine, 2072 Ponderosa Court, Bellingham, Washington. Um, I just want to talk about what I didn't see in the Gaza-Israel uh, resolution, what I did see. Uh, what, I didn't, what I did see is a, a conclusory statements regarding violations of international law for war and human rights. I also saw a thinly veiled request that Israel refrain from self-defense. What I didn't see is um, uh, Hamas's or reference to Hamas raining down rockets on Israel civilians since the Hamas takeover of Gaza from Fatah in 2007. What I didn't see was Hamas use of mosques, UN schools, hospitals, uh, and civilian homes as weapons storage facilities, <coughs> military operational headquarters, rocket and mortar launch sites, and terror tunnel transit centers. What I didn't see is Hamas's construction of terror tunnels that were specifically designed to terrorize, kidnap, and murder Israeli citizens. What I didn't see is a reference to any of the Hamas charter. Uh, this is referencing August 18, 1988, never been uh, changed. Article 13 reads, initiatives uh, and so-called peaceful solutions in international conferences are in contradiction to the principles of the Islamic resistance movement. There is no solution for the Palestinian question except through jihad. Initiatives, proposals, and international conferences are all a waste of time uh, and are vain endeavors. What I didn't see is uh, also Article 7 in the Hamas Charter, which says the Islamic resistance movement aspires to the realization of Allah's promise and then quoting from al-Bukhari's uh, rendition of Quran, quote, the day of judgment will not come about until Muslims fight the Jews, killing the Jews, when the Jews will hide behind stones and trees. The stones and trees will say, O Muslims, O Abdullah, there is a Jew behind me. Come and kill him. No more, never again, the Jewish people live on Israel high. Thank you, Bob. Okay, this is the end of the public comment period. <clears throat> We're going to take a five-minute break for folks, anyone who wants to leave and not stay for our committee work and for anyone who needs to take a break to do so. We can leave also, use the restroom, whatever you need. Five minutes, we'll be back. Thank you. We're all in the room, so I'm going to reconvene this meeting of Bellingham City Council. We'll start back up with our committee meeting reports. I'm talking slowly so Jack Weiss has time to get up here. <laughs> and we'll start with uh, Planning Committee with Jack Weiss, Chair. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, this morning we had two items uh, to, uh, to deal with and the first one was a work session to consider a comprehensive plan amendment to the Sunnyland Neighborhood Association to rezone approximately four acres of land in areas 1, 1A, and 8 of the Sunnyland neighborhood. In our 
we had a public hearing at our last meeting and we in our work session we uh, reviewed the uh, the sunny view, Sunnyland uh, proposal and we received a presentation from our staff uh, associated with a proposal that they put forward to us as a compromise uh, that was different that was not on the uh, uh, not before us uh, two <coughs> weeks ago the compromise had to deal with uh, addressing one of the major issues that we heard from the uh, the neighborhood which was the designation of multifamily versus single family uh, uh, in the staff's original proposal they were looking at uh, designating the area as multifamily in order to be able to use the uh, uh, the housing forms within the infill toolkit uh, they were able to work out a technical fix so that they could actually uh, address it as single family which addressed one of the needs, major uh, needs of the neighborhood. The, uh, the second had to do with whether or not there would be duplexes as a, one of the housing forms, and there was a concern that duplexes would, uh, would somehow generate a lot of rental uh, <laughs> stock in that area instead of home ownership. And what was substituted was townhouses uh, instead of uh, duplexes so they removed duplexes they put in townhouses and there would be small houses smaller houses and uh, detached ADUs and carriage houses as other housing forms in that in that area uh, so we uh, we went through a few things and uh, the bottom line is that the, the committee ended up uh, making a recommendation to accept the the staff's proposal, the compromise proposal, and uh, we unanimously agreed to that. Uh, there is one, one small issue that I think we can talk to staff about that had to do with something that Pat, uh, Pat McKee had brought up earlier tonight, which had to do with the neighborhood description. And, and um, uh, what I'd like to ask maybe, before I make the motion uh, for the staff proposal, what I'd like to ask uh, Greg and Moshe, uh, do we need to rewrite the neighborhood description? Because if we're going with the staff proposal, it seems like that there's some changes that needs to happen in the uh, the neighborhood description on page 21, Exhibit A. Good evening, Council. Greg Ockett, Planning Department. With me is Moshe Quinn. Um, with respect to Mr. McKee's concern about the neighborhood plan language, specifically um, multifamily housing. Um, multifamily housing would not be allowed in this area. The list of housing forms under the staff proposal is very specific. And so to introduce multi true multifamily housing forms would require a change to that section of our code, which is a legislative process, type six process, um, Planning Commission review and council approval. So it's not something that could just happen. Secondly, we provided um, language for the Sunnyland Neighborhood Plan Area 8. It was in your packet from a um, previous meeting that we think uh, is appropriate. And, uh, and so that would be our recommendation to use that language that we provided to you in your last packet. Uh, and not the language that came from the neighborhood. Okay, so the, you, you want us to use the language from the last packet, not, not what's in this, year, or this, this week's packet? That's correct. Okay, okay. I don't know. So what we, what we would propose is that if, if, if the full council wants to endorse the staff recommendation, we would bring that back to you in an ordinance form so you could see all of the language including the neighborhood plan language that we proposed um, and you could review that at next week's meeting because the ordinance that's in your packet is what we were directed to do which is the neighborhood's proposal so there isn't an ordinance in your packet that would approve the staff proposal so we would need to bring that back to you okay. for your next meeting so then you're looking at third and final of all of the comp plan amendments on september 8th yes okay uh, well, I guess with that information, then I'm not going to make a motion uh, until next week. Um, 
and we'll just have that for information unless unless uh, council wants to discuss what we talked about today yeah I would like to dis discuss because some of us weren't here or some of us only here for partial because we were at other meetings so so we didn't get a chance to I don't really know for sure what was and so I've got some questions about what was thrown out and I'd heard some things from that uh, that I've got questions about and okay. so I would very much like to discuss it because we haven't had a chance to discuss it or have questions answered because we figured we were doing that tonight okay well um, maybe Greg and Moshe could uh, just to give a quick rundown of what the staff proposal was I, I think we're all familiar with what the neighborhood proposal is and the um, uh, the property owner has put out their their description of what they would like and um, I'm wondering what I mean I could do that but maybe Greg if and Moshe if you would I'd rather to, have them do yeah. it <laughs> if you can kind of run down the, the differences between the three different versions then just real fast before you do that Greg mm -hmm. um, shouldn't we at the end of all this though forward our recommendation from committee to have staff prepare the new ordinance for next week yeah we can do that okay. yes thank you go ahead Greg okay so in our in our memo that's in your packet uh, stated August 4th uh, it, it contains two parts the first part um, were issues that we identified with the neighborhoods proposal and incorporating that into our um, development code the second half of the memo uh, is the staff's revised proposal and there are essentially two differences between the revised proposal and what we originally recommended this is a compromise um, that we came up with your microphone on Greg I can hardly hear you it is maybe I just need to get a little closer <laughs> seems a little low tonight yeah it does um, so there are two major changes there we go. two major differences between this proposal and the staff's original proposal the first is that we would keep the residential single zoning designation before we were recommending residential multi we figured out a way to keep the residential single designation and still allow the toolkit housing forms to be used so it would be zoned residential single the housing forms would be limited to those that are shown in your packet um, on page four and they are essentially the single family forms from the toolkit <coughs> The second major difference is uh, we substituted, as Jack mentioned, we substituted townhouses for duplexes. So under the staff proposal, townhouses could be built on the site, but duplexes could not. Otherwise, the density stays the same. Everything else, the design standards all stay the same from our original proposal. It's just those two changes um, that we thought were a compromise that addressed um, the majority of the neighborhood's concerns. Okay. Does the staff's proposal allow the infill toolkit forms or require? It requires them. Hmm. And that's the major that th that's the major difference between the staff's proposal and the property owner's proposal. I mean, mm -hmm. there are some other differences, but the most significant one is that change. The property owner wants the infill housing forms to be optional staff has them as being required hmm. thank you thanks Greg I realize this is a compromise so not everybody's gonna be really happy um, but I am a little confused by some of the letters here from the property owners from Sunset Commons and from the attorneys who one of the lines says if either is adopted nothing will be built um, this has me a little concerned because I think the whole objective here is for us to have some development um, so I'm wondering uh, just trying to understand what happened in the committee earlier today about why why this is a pretty extreme statement I, I'm thinking so I'm trying to understand <coughs> I thought this was a bit of a compromise and I, can you help me understand why why this would be so conclusive nothing will be built do you <laughs> I don't quite understand um, I can't help you with that uh, I can tell you that we met with the property owner and we went over this staff proposal and we thought we had uh, support for it um, I don't know what happened in the interim um, 
but we thought once we explained what the staff proposal was and the things that the infill toolkit allowed, um, we thought we had the property owner's support. Obviously, we don't. Um, if council adopts zoning for the property that the property owner doesn't agree with, he can always submit a proposal to change it. Um, beyond that, I, I can't explain that statement any more than that. But there, there was conversation, so yes. we did include them in the conversation, oh, yeah. so yes. I don't understand. Okay, I, thank you. Roxanne and then Terry. I hope one thing that we'll really consider, though, is the property owner's perspective in this. The property owner isn't trying to be a bully in this. The property owner isn't trying to suffocate us with things that they want. They just really want to do right by the community and by the neighborhood. And so thus, I hope we will consider the fact that for the infill toolkit, that has only been used once. This is almost comical that we would want to require that when it's something we've been pushing and it has only been used once. I'm more on the side of it making sense if it's applicable for the property rather than absolutely outright, outright requiring it. I understand the neighborhood's concern about design specifics, but these are developers and property owners that have done projects throughout our city that have not been in conflict with the neighborhoods that they've developed in. And this is going to be something that I think they'll do for the Sunnyland neighborhood also. So I really hope that we will strongly consider what's coming from the property owner because they know what will make the project pencil. They know what will make economic sense. They will be the ones that will be upholding the laws and the policies that we're trying to implement to assure the neighborhood character. So I just want us to please take that into consideration for all that they have been through along with what we have all been through as a community. Terry? Yeah. I understand, you know, since the toolkit's been out there for so long that people really want to see it built, but to pick one specific property owner and say this is the one where we're going to require, not allow, I, you know, I kind of deal with Roxanne with this. This is kind of a onerous kind of thing to you know, pick out one property owner and say this is the way it has to be. The single family designation and the inability to use it, I, that's how I originally read it and I thought, okay, and the property owners will and you go along with that, that sounds okay. But to say you have to develop it this way, whether I think I can sell this or not is a, is a is a tough one, you know. I don't want you coming in and telling, you know, me I have to do it this way. I want the guidelines of whatever the zoning is and have some freedom of being able to to do that. Uh, with this proposal, is with your proposal too? Is it it's all infill toolkit? Or how much is it is but keep in mind the infill toolkit detached single family houses are one of the permitted uses so, so they can if, be all single if the property family. owner wanted to build single family houses detached single family houses on 5,000 square foot lots throughout the entire area using the toolkit he could do that so they could develop yes. all single family on 5,000 square foot I, I see the, the property owners all shaking their, and proponents all shaking their head no. So I, I, now I'm getting real confused, so let's be real clear. It, that, under this proposal, they could develop 5,000 square foot lots, single family, yes. attached homes. Yes. Hmm. Team. I brought this up this morning, and the more I hear it, I think this might be the language to get us out of this. Uh, it, it use qualifier. Use the infill toolkit can be optional, not required. Why don't we just say that? That's what I brought up this morning, and I know Jack's going to 
I mean, we're just going, you know, the, the frustrating thing about this is we take three steps forward and 25 steps back every time we talk about this. And I'm not trying to no. be funny because right. no, it I'm, is happening here. And at some point it. in time, this body's got to pass something. So, you know, it, I have the same concerns. If the infill toolkit's the big hang up, let's just say infill toolkit is optional but not required. I, I don't know what else to say. Check. So this is this is the deal that I see and, and why I would strongly encourage you to look at it a different way and that it should be required. This is a compromise that the staff is putting forward. Yeah. The neighborhood has to sacrifice a little bit more density from 28 to 35 homes. That's only seven now. That's not. It's only seven, only seven. But, but they are compromising to that end and a few other things. And, and uh, the property owners what they're, what they're having to compromise on is the fact that they would have to go through a, a design standards of the, of the toolkit. Now, the design standards are there for a particular reason. It's, it's to make sure that, the, you know, we really, really screwed up on the infill toolkit by, by putting it in multifamily when it was designed for single-family purposes. <coughs> we really blew it a few years back. But that aside... Here's an opportunity for us to be able to do the right thing, and you know we're going to call it single family, and we're going to go and put the, you know these particular forms into a single family neighborhood. Here's the most important part: is that it has design standards. Now, if we want to go and put in optional language in there, we can go and have 35 snout house uh, snout houses. You know, where, where the garages are going to be the most prominent thing in the, in, in the entire uh, development. That's what we could have. You, you have no guarantee. But we have the ability to go and at least have design standards where the garages would be, uh, you know, put in the back and, and would be properly designed. That the front of the, of the, of the house that's facing, facing the street or the common area that that would have some sort of aesthetic, uh, pleasing nature to it for neighborhood character, as is the case in the Sunnyland neighborhood. We do not have snout houses in the Sunnyland neighborhood. But we could go and put it, make it optional, and we could allow for that. I don't particularly want that. I want to have something that is a little bit more pleasing for the neighborhood to preserve that neighborhood character. We're going to have more density, but, at the, it, but we should also have neighborhood character. And until the council is willing to go and have design standards for single-family housing, this is really one of the only options that we have. And I think that the staff did a, a very good job of threading the needle and, and taking the best that they could out of both of the, you know, both of the positions in coming up with a good compromise. And again, with a compromise, as we said before, a compromise is not going to make everybody happy and probably should make nobody happy. But that's, you know, that's, I think, where we are. And so I really would encourage us to go and look at that. And in fact, what I'd like to do is to push forward with the unanimous decision that we had this morning uh, and I'm going to change it around a little bit so that we would direct the, uh, you know, so the, I would move that we would direct the staff to prepare a first and second ordinance for uh, next week to support the, the staff proposal number two. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. I want to just check, did, did staff have something they wanted to say in response to Gene or Jack? Yeah, uh, Moshe Kuhn with the planning department. Uh, Jack actually stole some, stole some of my thunder that I was thinking of, and uh, you know, as staff person being in the middle of what the pro what the property owner wanted, as well as what the neighborhood associate wanted, we basically put together the best proposal we could, especially looking at similar design standards that are already in the toolkit that were designed to protect existing neighborhoods. You know, looking at what uh, the property owner proposed here. You know, they, they also want to have the opportunity to do standard single-family detached, which would not require design review at all, but also having the ability to do the toolkit. So you're looking at some <coughs> mixing and matching. You know, they also looked for flexibility in the development standards. 
the toolkit provides a lot of flexibility in lot design as well as street frontage, lane development, you know, for different individual properties. So we were looking at the best tool that we have under our, ex under our existing regulations <coughs> to put forward what council had docketed us for us to look at, and that was the neighborhood's proposal. You know, even looking at uh, what the property owner proposed, he also proposed cluster. Well, what's also in here is if he, if he looks at doing a cluster, he can also apply for a cluster bonus as well as they increase the units from 34 to 51 through the hearing examiner. So there's different elements in here that aren't fully looked at just yet, but there are some, some issues here that we see with what they're proposing. They're also proposing you know, different types of special regulations that can only be approved by the hearing examiner under specific hardship conditions. So basically, in the toolkit, you have the hearing examiner as well as the planning director based on certain site constraints and different criteria. So there's a little bit more flexibility there as well. They also look for detached garages. Detached garages are permitted. The infill toolkit already allows that with the housing forms. So it's like mm -hmm. they're trying to take a little bit of both and put together the best proposal, but staff still believes that this is the best proposal that we're putting in front of council. And uh, thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Moshe. Terry? Earlier this morning, uh, Patrick McKee <laughs> made a proposal from the neighborhood about uh, single family detached along Illinois. And I heard staff say that they wouldn't have a problem. It sounded like staff was saying, that wouldn't be a problem if, if council decided that was what we wished. It, did I hear that correctly? Yeah, so the neighborhood's proposal is that um, cottages not be allowed on Illinois Street, only the small and smaller detached single family houses. Okay. Um, I guess we would be okay with that. I would just point out that under the toolkit, cottages are detached single family units. They're just smaller units, but they are detached single-family units. Well, They're the same. I, They're the same. We're all single family. In that case, I would like to uh, propose that we uh, uh, go with uh, uh, that proposal of the Sunnyland neighborhood of single-family allow only allowed on uh, Illinois Street. Since staff thinks it works? No. So we have a motion. Is there a second? Doesn't it just say the same thing, or it's is that what you just said? He's amending. Yeah, so it, if, you, if, if okay. you prohibit cottages on Illinois Street, then the small and smaller housing forms would be allowed. Mm -hmm. uh, they're detached yeah. single family units, mm -hmm. as are cottages. Cottages are just smaller homes. But yeah, we can, we can support that, that change. All right, I'll second Terry's motion. Okay, so let's. Hold on. Jack had made a motion that Gene seconded There's to an create oh, the ordinance. An amendment. Right. Do that. So I'm just clarifying yes. so that we're all on the same okay. page. So this is to um, amend Jack's ordinance or to have um, a separate? That this is amending Jack's. And what would that language be? Um, directing staff to prepare an ordinance for first and second reading to accept the staff recommendation with the well mine is to amend the staff's recommendation to okay. whatever I, I, I'm not sure that they've Great. got the language we've from, got it so that okay. under they the have the language from, lists, from Sunnyland under the housing forms where help, it lists help cottages Linda. help Linda yes under read that, it for Linda okay page four the zoning table mm -hmm. attachment one which is at the bottom of the table there where it lists cottage that. So we would say cottages not permitted along Illinois Street, mm -hmm. except not permitted along Illinois Street. Well, that would allow cottages everywhere else in the development, just not along Illinois Street. Okay, so we have a motion in the second uh, to amend Jack's motion. Um, and is there any discussion on this amendment, Michael? When I heard Terry's proposal to <clears throat> allow single family 
um, along Illinois, that to me is quite different from what I just heard, which is that cottages are not permitted along Illinois. If indeed it is cottages not permitted along Illinois, I have no problem supporting it, but that's quite different from single family. Single family is not a single family type of design under the toolkit, it's single family. So my proposal was supporting the Sunnylands proposal from this morning, and that okay. was it. So, so if it indeed so there's is, nothing to argue about on that one. No, it's clarification. If it is indeed cottages are not permitted on Illinois Street, then I think I will support the amendment. Did anyone else want to speak to that motion? I will. Um, if it's really no difference, um, cottages are a. I'm not going to support the motion. I think it's ridiculous. Jack? I concur with you. Okay. We're getting more Because, because cottages are single-family housing. Right. It's just very clear, and it, it makes no sense to, uh, to discriminate against that type of housing form. Any other discussion? Okay. My only part of the discussion is, you know, we're trying to work with all the parties here. It made sense when... Sunnyland brought it forward since staff agreed that it was not a problem. So I will support the neighborhood on that. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I understand that. Um, however, the, cha the very, very fundamental change to not zone this property multifamily is a massive compromise already. It's true. <clears throat> okay, um, we're going to vote on this amendment to Jack's motion, um, and can, can we read the language just to be clear? In section BMC 20.00.200 in the zoning table under special regulations, item 2B, We'll read BMC 20.28.080, cottages except not permitted along Illinois Street. Let's just say cottage houses are not permitted along Illinois Street. Okay. That's simple. That cottage houses are not permitted along Illinois Street. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? No. 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 Okay. All those who said... I please raise your hand. Two old dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so motion uh, fails uh, two to five with Knutson and Borneman mm -hmm. in support. Mm -hmm. Okay, Terry? Yeah, I want to just throw this out there f for the record and just questions with it. This is the first time we're changing something that's single family allowing the toolkit, and it's Stating just this <coughs> piece of property. I know there's concern, there was some concern expressed from the Sunnyland people, there's concern from other neighborhoods that this is the wedge that allows this to be used in other single family neighborhoods. The precedent is out there that now that this precedent, if we vote on this, that, okay, that's been allowed already, so. We're going to try to move this allowed for other single family neighborhoods. And I want to make at least my objections known that if we do vote on this, this is, is a exception used in this one specific thing and not the council saying, yeah, we'll just allow this wherever. I know Jack thinks it was a mistake, but the council didn't think it was a mistake that we, this wasn't a single family, wasn't allowed in a single family. So I want to throw that out there that this is not us endorsing this as the other single family neighborhoods. Because if it is, then I'm definitely not going to support it. Michael? And I want to hear staff's reaction about that as well. Okay. I agree with Jack that the infill toolkit was fundamentally flawed from the beginning, and I said so when it was adopted. I think the council made a mistake, and the mistake they made is they lumped together 
those forms of infill housing which are appropriate and acceptable and compatible with single family neighborhoods with those which are incompatible. And then they further compounded the mistake, they, because I wasn't on the council at the time, by allowing it only in multifamily zones where it res where would only result in underdevelopment and uh, underutilization of the land. That was a mistake. This is the first time I've seen that mistake corrected by carving out only those that are appropriate for single family neighborhoods and then using in an area which is transitional so that it harmonizes with a single family neighborhood but does allow increased greater density. I don't think this is the Trojan horse destroying single family neighborhoods. I think is the first time I've seen this intermediary type of development used in an intermediary type of way. So I think this is potential for a great success. And the reason we haven't seen infill toolkits used, I think, are twofold. One, we had a recession, and two, it was uh, fundamentally flawed in its application. So I see this as the first chance for proper application in a way which does not threaten single-family neighborhoods. I don't see it as a Trojan horse in single-family neighborhoods at all. I see it as the appropriate transitional use, which is how we've used it in our urban village areas already. Gene. Great. Can you remind me this morning um, when I asked Brian Smart, the infill toolkit has been used somewhere. He said that this morning. Can you remind everybody? It where? is being used currently on Peabody Street. Um, the property owner is in for permits. Um, I don't remember the, the mix of housing types, but um, it's, the, it's the parking lot behind the old uh, Fountain Drug oh, building. Oh, that's what's going on. Over yeah. Okay. Jack? I'm still waiting to hear staff's response. We'll get staff's that. response okay. is that um, it's only being used in this area, the infill housing forms. Using it in any other area would require a code change. So it is only using it in this area. And it's only the single family forms of the toolkit that are being used here. So a small and smaller house, cottage and townhouse, those are all single family forms from the toolkit. Those are the only ones that are being allowed in this area. <coughs> Jack? Yeah, just a, also a note, I think the Trojan horse actually started up in the King Mountain area when when there was a provision. I think this is where Moshe, he, he was able to pick this up and I give him credit for all of that. It was that King Mountain had an exception in there as well for any new annexed property that could be single, it could mm -hmm. be zoned single family and have the toolkit uh, as as part of that that zoning. So I mean, it's already there, Terry. It's just right. you we, know we're doing this now, and and I would hope that our staff is continuing to work on what we knew about from last year was a revision to to the toolkit, including rebranding it and not calling it the toolkit anymore, but. Uh, I think they really are innovative housing forms, and we should be looking at them as innovative housing forms that we should be uh, applying citywide uh, in in uh, all neighborhoods. Roxanne, uh, I'm just going to move to call the question on this then. So I would make an emotion a motion to create an amendment that would not require the toolkit to be used, but that it be an option. That'll be an option. I'll second it, just for discussion. <laughs> okay, we have a motion in the second to amend Jack's mm -hmm. motion, mm -hmm. making the toolkit optional. Mm. Making the housing forms from the toolkit that have been selected optional. Well. <clears throat> is there any discussion? Yeah, there is discussion, because I brought that up a little while ago, and uh, you know, like I said before, <laughs> I don't know. I'm not going to say anymore. Okay. Sometimes it's better just to vote and not say nothing. <laughs> That's true. Sometimes it is. Michael? Good for myself. I'm not going to support the motion um, because what's left behind, I think, if you make the infill toolkit optional, is just ordinary <laughs> single family development with has no design guidelines and, and no control over it. It's the Wild West of zoning regulations. Um, 
I've only been on the council for a little over four years, but I get phone calls all the time about people really upset with atrocious things that people are doing in their neighborhood that they think are against the neighborhood character. And I say, it's single family zoning. There's no rule preventing any of this. And people feel like they're not protected by the zoning code. So one of the things we've done in most of our most recent planning efforts uh, in urban villages and this is to put in flexibility but some guidelines to ensure that the um, architectural forms um, are of a better type, the type that, that we don't receive complaints about. This is a part of a motion, a long-term motion in modern planning to move more towards what's called form-based zoning where you specify how the building relates to the neighborhood because that's usually what affects people the most and you try to say less and less about what goes on inside the building which maybe isn't people's business. So I see this as um, moving towards kind of a mixed form based zoning as progressive and if we make this optional I think it just undoes all that good work. And I think that the single family types in the toolkit are good types and, and I, th I think I, I that's enough I, I will just say that thank you Roxanne I get a little uneasy and uncomfortable in the equity of this though because we are asking one single site sp specific property to do this yet we're not requiring it for the area for the city for other properties so that's why I bring that forward. Should we be requiring it for this one property or should it be an option? That's my question. I'll speak to that. Uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, that is uncomfortable because we messed up a while ago and we created this situation. Um, and we, with all respect to the property owner for the crap they've been through, uh, we contributed to this situation as well, and we need to begin to make the right steps, small as they are, to get us to a better place in the city of Bellingham when we have opportunities to look at zoning like this in these opportunity sites. Um, I think um, the toolkit is a bust in many ways, but what it did provide us was um, a great learning experience and uh, a beginning. I hope that it doesn't prevent us from being able to take the good things that we've created from those years of work and begin to apply it where it would be appropriate. I, I suspect that what's happening here is we've had so many bad experiences with these types of conversations that we don't see the solution right now before us, um, as good as it is, and as a compromise. Um, and I, I also think, um, you know, it's a property owner's prerogative and job to argue for flexibility, um, but it's our job to say what we need, and that's what we're going to do. And if it doesn't work for them, they can ask us for another solution, or they can sell the property. So we have to make a choice now and start moving forward. I will not support the motion um, to make the toolkit optional, as this is a property where the staff proposal, I think, is very appropriate. And um, a look at what's possible in the future. Um, I said I wasn't going to say anything, but now I'm going to say something. Um, the, you know, I understand what everybody's saying, but when, and, and you just said it, if we go ahead with this, they're obviously not going to build anything. I mean, I'm just reading their letter, that something that you alluded to, too, but, you know, that's, that's, that's their choice, not, not our problem. But uh, I don't know. I, I'm going back and forth. I, I agree with what Roxanne is saying. I mean, we're making an example out of one property owner, but this has been an ongoing um, thing for nine years now at some point we have to move forward so uh, I think I'll just stick with my original <clears throat> okay let's vote on the amendment to make the toolkit housing forms optional all those in favor please say aye 
Aye. All those opposed? No. no. Okay, and those in favor, can you raise your hands? Okay, so motion fails uh, five, two, or two to, two five, to five, with um, Vargas and Murphy in support. <laughs> Back to the main motion. motion. Is there any further discussion on the main motion directing staff to prepare an ordinance uh, for first and second reading at our next meeting to accept the staff recommendation? Seeing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes 7 0. Okay, motion passes 7 0. Next item from Jack? Yes, thank you. Our second item had to do with a uh, discussion regarding the resolution to docket three proposed comprehensive plan amendments for review in the upcoming year. Uh, we, uh, we discussed, we had primarily our discussion about the, uh, the third docketed item that came before, or the proposal, docket proposal that came before us, uh, not really spending much time on the other two that had been submitted um, and went through the, the planning commission process. Uh, through the discussion, what we came up with was uh, one motion, but I with your concurrence, Roxanne, I'd like to break it into two different motions, okay? Um, so we, we concurred unanimously to move uh, the resolution to support the Samish neighborhood areas one and nine uh, as, uh, as presented in our packet. And I so move. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second um, to move uh, support for the Samish areas one and nine. Is that correct? Yes. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes 7 0. And with the area eight, uh, where the church is located, we had. Um, a bit of discussion about that and one of the suggestions that was brought up by staff was to because there was an uneasiness uh, that had been expressed at, at the public hearing and has you know I expressed it for myself but it had to do with the fact that we we were kind of short-circuiting the uh, the pre-docketing process and that we would um, maybe be better you know, we, we would be doing this in a better way process-wise if we uh, would ask the applicants to go through the pre-docketing process and then come back to the council uh, to have it docketed in the same timeline and, and to have it with the, the other two that we just passed and docketed, uh, that it could in, be included in that, that overall uh, work plan that the staff would be doing f uh, over this next year. And uh, what staff had indicated was it would be about a two-month uh, two month process to go do the neighborhood meetings and, or meeting or meetings and then to uh, uh, do a planning commission review to get to a recommendation to the council. Uh, it's probably, you know, whether it's two months or whether it's three months, it still would pre present uh, enough time to be able to do the necessary work so that by the time that we come to the comp plan amendment time that you know we're going to be doing on September 8th we might be doing next August or September of next year that all that work would be done concurrent with the other two proposals that we just docketed um, the only uncertainty for the property owner and the, the folks that want to use the property in the, in the future is that, you know, there would be this uncertainty over the next couple months of whether or not there really would be a docketing, if the neighborhood would be very supportive, if the planning commission would recommend it, if we would actually go and, and pass and, and move forward with the docketing. But um, what we came up with as a motion this morning unanimously was to, uh, to move that the, uh, the Samish neighborhood area eight uh, would be docketed 
for purposes of zoning it from residential single to commercial planned and to move through the pre-docketing process to be brought forward to the council at, uh, at a future date. That's a motion. Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Pinky? I, I guess I don't quite understand because uh, when we voted on this previously, we all thought it was a good idea to move forward. So I'm not, it, it seems like they've done the neighborhood research and they, um, it's already specified what the use is going to be. So I guess I don't quite understand why we have such concerns about moving forward. It's that we did, we really did not follow the normal process that we normally do. And for me, I'll speak just for myself, but I think, I think the rest of the committee was, was maybe on board with this. But for me, it was just that here, we really did not follow our own process. And I, for me, I, I, really, I really think it's important to follow the process. I also feel like it establishes a precedent that might be, um, uh, it might come back to bite us when we just have anybody come to us at any time and, and want to jam something through and we don't have the necessary time to really reflect on it. I mean, I, I appreciate where they're coming from. I mean, they, they feel like they're under a real tight timeline and they need to go and get this stuff together so that they can make their, their plans. Um, but there is a process to doing that. And, you know, if we do it for them, are we going to be doing it for other people? And are they going to come to us with, with the, you know, we, we have the process for a reason. And, and that's, I, I think that if we compromise, and this is, again is a compromise, we're asking them to go through a two month process, a two and a half month process, three month process, whatever it's going to take to get to, uh, to a point of, of uh, where at least that part of it is dealt with. Um, I would be much more supportive of, of having it on the docket and to go, go through the review. Gary? Yeah, I'm kind of wondering by going through that process too. There is, you know, I think the, cur the proposed use is be a great use mm -hmm. and everything sounds good. But first, it's the idea of you're going to zone this from where it's currently zoned to a to a zoning that would allow if it's not bought by the clinic it would allow it to be greatly changed without having to go through the scrutiny of that process I think maybe by doing this it would uh, allow for a way to kind of nail down that use and certainty a little more than just passing it right now if that's the case then I can go along with that can I, can I, uh, there was uh, one other discussion item that came up was uh, a question about whether or not, why couldn't, why couldn't they just go and apply for, the, the church is a conditional use in a single family neighborhood. Right. Why couldn't they just simply go and do a, a conditional use as a medical office building? And uh, we found out that our code just simply does not allow that. And so the only way that this could really happen is through a docketing process, a comprehensive and neighborhood plan amendment change, going through the type six, you know, the full meal deal with that. And um, it's just the way it is because of the way that we have our codes written up. One thing that we did talk about was could we limit the, because of the fears of the neighborhood, could we limit the actual application of commercial plan to maybe just medical office buildings or something like that? and. Uh, you know, staff had responded saying that that could happen. You know, it, it's establishing a whole new zone, which is something we don't like to do, but it could happen in this particular uh, situation. We don't like to do that? <laughs> well, it's, we have 350 plus already. Oh, and <laughs> to establish another one just makes our city more complicated. Gene and then Michael. Greg, could you... Um, we heard from their attorney, Sammy, Sammy Jane, tonight that the time frame, can you reiterate the time frame again? I know, I know a lot of people 
don't believe we can do things swiftly here at City Hall, but I understand that. Some people have history with that. Well, sometimes we can. Um, I think the point is that um, a decision is not going to get made on what the zoning of this property is until this time next year, regardless of how long it takes to decide whether or not to docket it. Mm -hmm. If it gets docketed, it's going to be reviewed yeah. and it'll be approved or denied at this time next year. So the length of the docketing yeah. doesn't make a big difference, and docketing is not approval. Yeah, so right. I, hope the, uh, I hope everyone understands that just getting on the docket is not approval. Right, right. Okay. That pretty well sums it up. Okay. Michael, did you want to speak? I'm trying to remember where we are on this motion. Uh, this is to um, request that this goes back and fulfills the pre-docketing requirements first before we officially docket it. Is that correct? Correct. If so, I, I strongly support that. And I, I want to say what I said earlier, which is this is not a comment on whether or not the docking uh, proposal or the desired outcome by the uh, applicant is appropriate. I just think it's very important that we worry about what precedents we set. And we set process things not because they're neat and they're pretty, but because through process we respect the rights of others. To not follow the process is to disrespect the rights of others. So there's something in my mind that is serious which is at stake here. I understand that this is going to be an inconvenience for the property owner, but they chose to enter into a transaction for a property which was not zoned for their intended use. They bit this off. And I believe that we are going to be as accommodating as we can, but still respect the rights of other property owners by following the process. Um, it has been said, oh, but the use is specified and neighborhood meetings are held. Well, no, not actually neighborhood meetings are, are been held. They've done some good outreach. They've laid a solid foundation. No reason to think they'll run into problems, but they didn't actually meet the neighborhood meeting requirement. They say, well, the use is specified and it sounds good. Well, rezoning and docketing is not about whether or not they're going to have psychology offices in there. Anytime someone tells you, we've got letters in here that mental health services are sorely needed in our community, that isn't before us. No decision we make will or will make it happen or not make that happen. After this is rezoned, people say, we'll save the building. No, that building can be torn down. Our rezoning decision has nothing to do with whether or not that building will be psychology offices and nothing to do with whether or not that building will be preserved. Those are separate independent decisions. Our zoning decision and our docking decision is, is the range of allowable uses appropriate for that part of our town? That's the question, not these other questions. I think that has to be approached in um, uh, the right way, the way we've always done it, which is go through the pre-docking procedure. I have every intention of supporting docking when it comes forward. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be then please to see it, have the staff work with the neighborhood and the applicant to define an appropriate range of uses. If it's just uh, psychology offices, I will vote no. That's lousy zoning. But if it's not too broad and not too narrow, I will probably say yes. It's probably an appropriate rezone. Um, but I want to see this uh, played out uh, in the proper way. And I think it's important to realize that this time crunch was not manufactured by us. It's manufactured by the calendar. And I think that we're going to do what we can to get them on schedule. So a year from now, if we indeed choose to dock it, then the rezoning and the comp plan amendment will take place as soon as it would have taken place if we had, I think, inappropriately docketed it tonight. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation. Uh, I just want to say that I think that the intention here is fantastic, what it would bring to our community, but I do want to respect the process. And I do think that setting a precedent is important. Sounds like we are still offering a bit of a streamlined process for them, so thank you for that explanation. Roxanne. Just really quickly, um, I'll just say for myself, um, one of my parents is severe, severely mentally ill. And so when this proposal came to us, I, I become the activist for the understanding about mental illness. And I got carried away. And I wanted to push this forward as fast as I could. I apologize for that, because we do need to follow a process. And I just want you to know that you'll have my full support in this developing but also just to say, we need to get this moving quickly too, because after today's meeting, I may need to see you guys. <laughs> um, I'm wondering, is there any 
expedited planning commission well, 30 days notice there, there are ways that we can speed the process along as as much as is reasonable yes okay. as much as is reasonable is awesome <laughs> it's all we can ask right um, could I point out one thing so there is a resolution in your packet it is the resolution that we were directed to prepare which is for all three proposals if your council is going to do something different we have prepared a second resolution that you all should have no what? well we look for that I don't recall seeing that apparently we provided it to the council office anyway I can I can read the changes in would it Greg would it would not be the same one that we had from uh, uh, at the public hearing well we wanted to reflect the direction that you've given or that I think you're going to give us and so we've included a whereas that talks about this specific proposal and how you considered it and recommended that it go through the docketing process um, so there's just a couple of changes that we would need to make to the one that's in your packet if that's so this will be this will be amendments to the one that is published yes okay okay briefly before we do that I guess I'm alone in my um, opposition to this so I should say something um, I just for the record um, <clears throat> think that uh, we have processes for a reason and I think everyone has eloquently explained that and that there's a lot of truth in that this has been a great discussion this, after, this evening actually, I actually really enjoyed it um, and I I, um, I respect the fact that we fre frequently have long drawn out processes that seem way too long and drawn out but are for fairness and that's important um, of paramount importance for city government um, I do think there are times when that prevents us from accomplishing our goals in a more expedient manner and um, to me this is one of those times it's just docketing it's not approval and we have a, a business that um, is um, trying to enter and expand and be responsive to their needs and um, so I think personally that this is one of the times when exceptions uh, don't set any kind of precedent other than when a business has a time they would like us to accommodate their needs we would consider it um, so that's all I'll have to say and um, let's go ahead and read those changes into the record Greg Ready, Linda? Okay, so there would be a ninth whereas added to the resolution that would read as follows. And I can, I'll give you this language, but I just want to read it into the record. Whereas the City Council considered a resolution including all three proposals during a meeting on August 4th, 2014, and directed P Pacific Har Harbor Holdings LLC to follow the comprehensive plan amendment docketing procedures in BMC 2110-150, including a neighborhood meeting prior to a final council decision on docketing their proposal for review in 2014-2015. And then um, on page 35 of the packet, the second bullet would be deleted. That refers to docketing the, the proposal 801 Samish Way, so that would be deleted the second bullet and then on attachment 1a which is page 36 delete item number three yeah. and with those changes then this resolution is ready to go Michael I would note that I'm already counting nine whereas is so would that be the tenth this would be the the ninth, actually the tenth, is the, is the existing one that says, whereas the City Council also considered the recommendations of staff and the Planning Commission, the staff report, and the okay. public comment. I understand So now. it would go right in, the, in before that one. Okay. So I'll admit I'm uh, uncertain if I'm saying this right now that we've made these changes but um, Jack moved and 
Jean seconded. Um, that Samish, the Samish neighborhood area eight be docketed for purposes of zoning. There was something else after that, and then move through pre-docketing. Kathy, Kathy, sorry to interrupt, but Thank you. Um, it's not area eight that we're dealing with with the 801 Samish, they are actually in Area 4. Area 4. So yeah. I don't know where 8 came from. But well, it's, it's off of the map. Thanks. That's what I see. Oh, OK. Well, it's 4. Thank you. OK. Yeah. Uh, Linda, do, do you, can you read Jack's motion for this purpose, for voting? <laughs> um. Now that we've read the changes into the record, we can okay. just pass it's, his motion as yes. stated. Is that correct? Yes. Hi. I'm checking with Peter. So if you pass the resolution, you will have taken the first motion that was approved unanimously, and you will also have approved Jack's second motion if you just pass the resolution. So you could withdraw your motion and pass the resolution, and okay. that, would, that would have the now effect. Now that we've read it into the record. Well, actually, we, we already adopted the first one right. without really changing the language. Yeah, but it's important. The, the resolution has certain findings and whatnot, so mm -hmm. you will want to pass the resolution regardless. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. I have no problem. So we'll draw the, the motion on the table, and I will move the, uh, the resolution as amended by, by Greg. Second. Okay, we have a new motion in the second. Linda, did you get that? I think so. Well, what do we do with the... Well, you had one motion. That he withdrew. Uh, that's the one he's withdrawing? He withdrew You're the withdrawing motion on the, the table. Motion that was passed? No, he can't withdraw Not that, that. one. I, I made another motion to, right. to, to deal with this. I did it in two, and the first one was to adopt the motion to support the air, Samish Areas 1 and 9 as presented in the packet. Right, but it Correct. didn't actually adopt the resolution. It was, a, it was actually a meaningless motion <laughs> from what we're finding. Um, well, we passed it anyway. It, so it expressed intent. So you didn't mean to yeah. move the resolution. You meant just to support. I'm sorry. It's OK. Yeah. In that first motion, you weren't moving the resolution. You were moving support of. Yeah, the the motion was inaccurate because it really should have it should have supported the resolution and not just. It's okay the though; docketing. it can stand, and now we can yes. do your yes. second motion. So let let that motion stand in the vote stand, and now what we'll do is, uh, you know, and then I had made the motion about uh, about the area four yeah. or area eight one, and withdrawing that and then making a new motion that has to deal with the resolution specifically as, as amended by Greg uh, that would cover the first two, the area one and nine, and also provide the direction necessary for the other, uh, the other property. Very well put, Jack. <laughs> We're going to vote. <clears throat> Okay. All those in favor of adopting the resolution as amended, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, motion passes 7-0. End of committee. And that was Thank good. goodness. <laughs> Next committee up is Public Works Public Safety with Terry Borneman Chair. Thank you, Kathy. And I promise I'll make mine much quicker. <laughs> We had one item before us today. It was a report on the uh, test of body-worn cameras by the Bellingham Police Department. Uh, uh, Chief Cook uh, from, uh, uh, from the Bellingham Police Department presented the results of a trial period of testing body-worn worn cameras. It was a good presentation. Uh, the fiscal impact is that they're going to go with the three-year uh, contract to uh, and phase in the use of cameras. It'll cost $130,000. Most of that will be the purchase of cameras. Uh, there will be an ongoing uh, cost for storage of, uh, of evidence that will 
be roughly around $25,000. Um, it was for information only. Uh, yeah. Thank and the you. report. Thank you, Terry. Next up is Parks and Recreation, Roxanne Murphy Chair. Thank you. We had one item today. It's a noise variance for Lake Patton Golf Course Pond Restoration. So there is a small pond that is in the middle of the Lake Patton Golf Course and it's become overrun and overtaken by cattails and sediment. And so what Parks would like to do is do some construction to remove all of those things and restore the pond back to its natural state. But this is also busy season for golfing. We don't want to disrupt the golfers having their fun. So they, uh, Parks has requested a noise variance so that this construction can occur early morning and early evening hours between August 5th and August 29th. And I move that we grant the variance from the noise ordinance to allow for the restoration of the pond. Second. Hey, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Michael. Just a clarification. This is not for restoration to its natural area. This is an artificial lake and is being restored to its artificial condition. Thank Granted, you. let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes 7 0. End of committee? Yeah, yes, End of committee. Uh, or committee report. Um, <clears throat> next up was Community and Economic Development, Gene Knutson, Chair. Thank you, Kathy. We had one item. It's a project update on opportunity zones. The opportunity zones can include a variety of incentives to encourage development of certain types in certain places, such as affordable housing in urban villages. Staff provided an overview of the scope of work. Tara Sundin gave us a spreadsheet. I think everybody has a copy of it. It was a great report. We're making good progress. End of committee. <laughs> Thank you, Jean. Okay, committee of the whole. We had a couple of items this afternoon. Um, the first was um, healthcare benefits strategies now and into the future presentation. Um, we had someone from, uh, we had Beverly Lakey here from Association of Washington Cities Benefits Trust talking to us about changes in healthcare that are coming down the pike uh, that the city's going to need to address, especially in 2015 and 2018. Um, the, the key elements we discussed were the employer's shared responsibility or the pay or play item, as it's known, and that's effective January 1st of 2015. And the other one, perhaps more um, tricky, how we end up figuring out how to deal with it, is going to be the 40% or Cadillac version of excise tax, effective January 1st, 2018. Um, I think I'll just leave it at that unless anyone has anything to add. Okay. Uh, next up was extension and renewal of an emergency ordinance creating interim zoning for the establishment of facilities producing, processing, and retailing recreational marijuana. We had a 6-0 recommendation because Jean was out of the room. I was out. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Not really. Hopefully the camera wasn't on. Dale, cracking jokes. Okay, sorry, there we are. Okay, um, so we had a 6 0 recommendation um, to extend and renew the emergency ordinance creating interim zoning for the establishment of facilities producing, processing, and retailing recreational marijuana. Just to be clear, this is a continuation of existing. Uh, criteria and, and the situation as is for another six months. Any discussion before we vote? <laughs> Seeing none, all those in favor, Did please. Move? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. No. I would move approval of the ordinance. Thank Second. you. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, now we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? No. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, motion passes 7-0. Thank you, Michael, for catching that. Um, the third item was a, a second quarter financial review. I'll just say we're generally on trend with our budget. Um, there's some negative trends that we need to keep an eye on, but things were looking fairly good. Uh, the fourth item was an update on the fireworks ban enforcement. Uh, if folks are really interested in that, I encourage you to go watch it on um, 
well, watch on BTV10 or check it out online, but um, the general consensus was it was definitely quieter this year after the ban went into effect. We had a um, concerted effort from both our police and fire departments to be responsive and um, uh, have as much um, ha have as many resources deployed as possible to be able to uh, deal with the new fireworks ban. Um, I think there were 240 plus calls, they said, and there was one citation issued. And then our fifth item was a letter to Puget Sound Energy regarding divestment in coal power. Um, Jack and Jack moved and Michael seconded um, that we approve the letter and authorize me to sign and I so move. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on this item? Pinky? Just one, I want to reiterate that um, I am an energy efficiency manager at Puget Sound Energy and I will recuse myself from this vote. Great, thank you. Anything else? Oops, seeing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? What, uh, all, any abstentions? One abstention. Thank you. So motion passes 6-0 with one abstention. And the last item this afternoon was um, consideration of a resolution opposing the violence in Gaza and the targeting of civilians. We had a great discussion and the um, resolution died for lack of a second. Can I make a quick comment about since there was so much public? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Terry. Not to ask for a vote. Since there was so much, if someone viewing this, seeing uh, public comment probably doesn't, isn't, fully aware of what took place. But two weeks ago, uh, uh, a resolution was brought forward by certain groups. We asked, I asked the council if they wanted to discuss this. There was a unanimous vote to bring uh, something forward for discussion. And that's what, that's what was done. Uh, there was comments made about trying to, uh, sounding like we're beating up on one side or another. The two resolves, there was only two issues under resolves, basically. One was that uh, urged both Hamas and the government of Israel to refrain from military operations that are likely to result in casualties of innocent citizens and uh, support a cessation of hostilities in Palestine and Israel and encourage all parties to search for non-violent path, paths. So bringing this forward was not to try to single out and it's too bad we get into these great polarizations about this. Uh, just for a couple of people that did uh, make certain comments, somebody brought up a comment about the, you know, we would not condemn our U.S. government for, from the killing of a lot of civilians in Iraq. Wrong. The city council did do just that and we became the uh, first city in the state to become a troops home city and we called out the deaths of innocent citizens that were happening during that. So we have taken those, <laughs> yes, this council would do those kind of things when we see those kind of atrocities taking place, whether it's from our government or anybody else. So I just want to make those clarifications. Thank you, Terry. Yeah. I'm anyway. not trying to bring it back up as a motion, but just so people know what was going on. That's great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to say anything about that? I appreciate, oh, go ahead, Michael. The um, resol resolution part of the resolution, um, I think, did uh, appropriately not pick sides. Um, unfortunately, in the recital part, it's just very hard to talk about the troubles in the Middle East mm -hmm. without people's feelings being hurt. Right. And I think what we heard were all those hurt feelings. And so um, one person said to be silent is to be without conscience. Well, I personally am not silent on this matter, um, but I just didn't think this was the vehicle to do it. But we had a good discussion. We did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we have one set of minutes to approve from January 21st. Or January 21st. Where are we behind? <laughs> July 21st. All entertainment. Thank you. Second. 
Okay, we have a motion and a second. And Linda, I have a note here. Ask me about a correction. Yeah. On page on page seven, I have the public comment continued after the public works public safety meeting, and it was just before, so I'll move that back. Okay, great. Okay, so we can change that to be as amended for approving these minutes. Okay. Anything else? Seeing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, minutes past 7 0. Old and new business. We had a couple of items this afternoon. Um, real quickly, uh, I mentioned that the City Council now has a, a page at cob.org backslash council where you can click official letters and articles of the City Council. Um, we also discussed um, using our staff resources at the City Council office to create a City Council annual report at the end of the year. It would be brief, but it could um, summarize some of the key things that we worked on this year with the administration and some of our successes. It's only halfway through, so we've still got time. And then also um, using some of our staff resources to uh, look into bringing the MLK event back to City Hall or in some capacity that the city has sponsored it in the past. And Terry's going to work with um, Marie in our office to, to look into that. Uh, and I wanted to uh, bring up um, that we met with, a couple of us met with Governor Inslee this week, but I imagine maybe, Kelly, you would address that in your mayoral comments, or should I bring it Maybe you'll, you should add something because I don't actually know a lot about it and I was there. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, what, was this Tuesday or Wednesday? What day is it? Thursday. Clearly, I'm on top of that. Uh, Thursday of last week, um, I was invited to lunch with um, Kelly and um, Carl Weimer, president of County Council and Jack Laus was there, uh, Whatcom County Executive, also Mike McCauley uh, from the Port of Bellingham and Rob Fix from the Port uh, to meet with Jay Inslee and some of his staff. Um, and we had a nice lunch and discussed some things about Bellingham and Whatcom County. And then later that afternoon went to a, a larger presentation um, at the ferry terminal where a number of port staff and Department of Ecology staff talked about the waterfront redevelopment site, the work that we have put into that over the last you know, many years, but more recently um, uh, kind of finalizing the planning for that site and what needs to begin happening in the future, especially at the state level. Also, Kevin Ranker, uh, Jeff Morris, and Vincent Byes were in attendance and some members from the Blue Green Coalition, I think Resources and the CR Club, and uh, labor folks were at the table as well. Um, and then there was a nice article in Bellingham Herald about it. Um, Governor Inslee had some very pertinent questions, was, seemed very impressed with the opportunity we have to do something pretty remarkable at our waterfront. Uh, asked what, what we need from the state to do that. I think the response that was quoted in the paper from Mr. Fix at the port was preserve matka, preserve matka, preserve matka, essentially money for environmental cleanup. Anything you'd like to add, Kelly? There were great presentations, and I want to commend Tara Sundin and Ted Carlson yes. <clears throat> because they did a very good job of talking about the city's participation and the city's role in next steps. Um, it was nice to have Kevin Ranker and Jeff Morris and Vincent Bice there so that um, legislators were hearing about this directly and um, I guess uh, got a lot of information but also uh, the enthusiasm that the governor had showed uh, for the project. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of talk about could this be a pilot mm -hmm. um, and I think that the legislators that were, that were there, um, especially Jeff and and uh, Kevin will be following up with the governor's staff on this, which yeah. is really good. I mean, sometimes you have to get people out of Olympia and up here so that they can see what wonderful stuff is going on. It was very helpful for the Green, Green Blue Caucus members to be there mm -hmm. and to be all focusing in on um, this project and the cleanup that needs to be done and the jobs. So. 
Um, I thought it worked out really well, and I think the governor, even though he was a bit under the weather, was pleased with how it turned out. So uh, that was very good. Yeah, it was. And those were very good presentations by um, Ted and Tara. Thank you. Yeah, and I guess I'll just add, I got so bogged down in waterfront planning last year, I forgot that there were some exciting opportunities at that site in a way. And to have it re-presented for me as well was refreshing. Um, I kind of remembered some of my early enthusiasm. <laughs> so, wish you all could have had that. <laughs> well, but it was... It's one of good. the things that Mark Lauer said was about the aluminum frames. Mm -hmm. So we have one of the biggest solar panel manufacturers in Bellingham, and they buy their aluminum frames from China. Right. And he was suggesting that we might want to make some connection between Alcoa mm -hmm. <laughs> and that company to see if there was a possibility that that would be something we could do um, down on the waterfront. Yeah, that's so. right. I think you said something like, if there's one thing we know how to do, it's work with aluminum. Yeah. Okay, so any other old or new business? Okay, seeing none. Um, I'll report out from our executive session. This afternoon we had five items. First was litigation. Uh, Fred Meyer Stores and Lummi Nation's appeal of the MDNS and consolidated permit issued for the Costco project. Uh, staff provided an update on a litigation matter. Direction was given. No action was taken. Second was potential property acquisition. Staff provided information on a potential property acquisition. And uh, I'll entertain a motion to authorize the purchase of real property located near Agate Bay in the Lake Whatcom watershed from the Shatabi Trust for 700000 with an anticipated closing date of August 12, 2014. So moved. Oh, you have to move it. Nice. Jack and Pinky mm -hmm. moved and seconded, unit, like simultaneously. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes 7-0. Third item in executive session was labor relations bargaining strategy. Staff provided information on labor, labor relations bargaining matters. This was for information only, no action was taken. Fourth item was potential property acquisition. Staff provided information on a potential property acquisition. And I will entertain a motion to authorize the purchase of real property located at 1714 22nd Street, Bellingham, Washington, from Carolyn Sue Blethen for $194,000 with an anticipated closing date of September 15th, 2014. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes 7-0. Fifth item was litigation, Ferlin et al. versus Chuckanut Community Forest Park District, Whatcom County, Stephen Oliver, and the City of Bellingham in Whatcom County Superior Court. Staff provided information on a litigation matter. Direction was given and no action was taken. And at this time, I'll turn it over for the mayor's report. Thank you, President Lima. Um, I also wanted, I forgot someone to thank for the governor's visit, and that was um, Brian Heinrich. He worked with the port, and Lacey Harper, who is the governor's Northwest representative, and it was very, it was a very smooth um, um, visit, except for the fact we didn't get to go out in the boat because the governor had something else he had to do. Um, the one of our recommendations for our uh, public health and safety, both downtown and citywide, was mental health court. It's funding that we had expected to come forward years ago, and the city, uh, county council did approve that funding at their meeting, which was after our meeting. So I thought I would bring it up. I'm very happy about that. It's um, demonstrated really good results in other cities that have a mental health court. Uh, second uh, letter went to um, Chairman Ballou about the naming of the Cornwall Beach Park, which uh, the, the Parks Commission is recommending Clipson Beach Park. So that went out there for, for any of their comments, and that will be coming forward to the council. Um, if you drive into town, you will see that we met our 50% goal 
on our insurance participation of the health care surveys. And now we have well city signs that are um, up on the, the entering sign posts. I think we have a lot of signs. Way to go. Yeah. Well, you guys, I hope you all filled out your questionnaires because that helped. $35 gift card. Well, we had over 50% participation by the employees. You only need 50%, and it saved us 2% on our health care costs this year. Excellent. Which is really great. Yeah. And um, we had our presentation on Opportunity Zones. Um, we sent a press release out um, so that, pe that people could know something was happening. Had a nice quote from Jack in it, and I'm very pleased um, that we can move forward on this. I think it's an important issue. And uh, anyway, I, I just thought it was good. It was something we worked on together. And I appreciate that. Um, one approval for the Museum Foundation Board, uh, Lorraine Bollard. She's got quite a resume. Um, I don't think she can volunteer anymore. But she has been very active in the museum and uh, other, other city um, boards and commissions, and she's thrilled to be able to go on the foundation board. So I would ask you to approve her appointment. Move approval. Second. The motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? <clears throat> motion passes 7-0. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next item is consent agenda. Approval. Second. Uh, that right out there. Huh? And we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Michael and then Jack. Yeah, I talked with Kathy about this before. Um, I think the downtown plan and associated development regulations are important enough that it seems very strange for me to have them on the consent agenda. I was going to... Um, we talked about moving them out of the consent agenda, just having to be voted on separately. Uh, I, I think the consent agenda is for routine matters, and I consider moving forward on the downtown planning anything but routine. I don't know how we'll handle it at this point, though. I don't yeah. know. Can we remove it from the consent agenda? You have to make a motion to remove the item out of the um, consent I make a motion to uh, remove item uh, agenda item number 20464, adoption of downtown building and plan associated regulations from the consent agenda. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? I'll just say uh, this was kind of routine cleanup for some things that were missed the first time around. Um, I, someone want to change my mind as to whether what we should do? I'm kind of ambivalent, Jack. Well, it, it was. I think it was proposed to me first by the staff, and I. I thought it was a good idea to have it in consent agenda. It doesn't matter one way or the other, but um, okay. Any can, other discussion? We can separate Peter? it out. Oh yeah, Peter. I just want to clarify. I mean, I was part of the discussion. I mean, what happened was is that it was one of those situations where you had an ordinance in a packet on one at one council meeting, and then I think it wasn't anticipated that it was going to be voted on mm. at the next meeting. And so there was a vote. I think it was very clear what you were voting on, but the actual ordinance wasn't in that packet. So we felt, and you took a first and second vote on this. Right. So this was a matter of having a first and second vote with the actual ordinance in the packet, and that's all it was. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor of removing the first item, adoption of the downtown Bellingham plan and associated development regulations from the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? No. no. Okay. Uh, who was I? Me and Michael. Okay. Motion Thank you, buddy. I've been on the losing end of everything tonight. Two with Knutson and Lilliquist right in favor. Um, <laughs> okay, so back to consent agenda. We had a motion and a Join second. Join the club, right? <laughs> Any further discussion One. of the consent agenda? Who reads it? That's the first time I've ever seen it. No, I just seen none. Good job, Michael. You read the consent agenda. Uh, boy. Wow, I'm losing control yeah, here. Yeah, sure gone. Gavel them down. It's almost, it's almost time to end this mm. puppy. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of the consent agenda passing, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, consent agenda passes 7-0. Final consideration of ordinances.
Agenda Bill 20504, an ordinance appropriating funds from the estimated ending restricted reserve and the Public Education and Government Access Television Fund to increase one part-time position in the Information Technology Services Department to full-time. Move third and final. Second. Michael Lilliquist. Aye. Roxanne Murphy. Aye. Pinky Vargas. Aye. Jack Weiss. Aye. Terry Borneman. Aye. Jean Knudsen. Aye. Kathy Lehman. Aye. Ordinance passes 7-0. Agenda Bill 20486, an ordinance relating to the 2014 budget increasing revenue on the Storm and Surface Water Utility Fund by $28,440 as a result of a grant award from the Washington State Department of Ecology to the City of Bellingham for the Pharmaceutical Take Back Program program and appropriating related expenditures. Move third and final. Second. Roxanne Murphy. Aye. Pinky Vargas. Aye. Jack Weiss. Aye. Terry Borneman. Aye. Jean Knudsen. Yes. Kathy Lehman. Aye. Michael Lilliquist. Aye. Ordinance passes 7-0. Oh, that, that, oh, there were just two. Sorry. Okay, yeah, thank you. This two. meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>